Okay, we're going to go ahead and start tonight's meeting. We'll call to order. Um, our Pledge of Allegiance will be oh, all council members are all present and accounted for. And we'll, we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance offered by Courtney Varney, led by Courtney Varney. And then our opening remarks will be given by Jack Freeman. citizens of Pleasant Grove. We're happy and good community here in the foot, foothills of the mountains. Father, we're very thankful for our good citizens who serve on this council. For them doing the very best that they know how to guide our, our city in a proper manner with integrity and, and love for their community. Father, our hearts go out to the citizens of our city who are struggling in their families and their family situations. We, our heart also goes out to the citizens of Paris. Bless them as they pick up the pieces from the evil that has been done among them. We pray that in our behaviors, we will find the strength within ourselves to be kind and respectful to others, even though we may not understand their backgrounds and, and their feelings. May we be kind to one another. And may we continue to support our city employees <coughs> who are doing their best to serve us. They're good people. We're, we're blessed to have them. Now bless us in this meeting this night that we might have thy spirit to be here, to be in each of our hearts, that we might be kind and do the business of the city in a pleasant and responsible way. These blessings we humbly thank thee for. Thank thee for, Father, in the name of my beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you're just joining us, I don't know how many are in the hall. Um, we took a poll here, and several people are here just to hear the election results. Some are here to just uh, hear the accessory apartments, and then others are here just to be here. Uh, or have another item on the agenda. So we're going to adjust the agenda. And if we get too crowded when we, uh, when we get going here, we're going to adjourn the meeting in this room and head over to the, the fire base where they're working on setting up a, a place for us. We actually asked them to do it earlier, so they were ready. Okay, um, on tonight's agenda then, what are the changes that we want to make? Here at Hubbock, we discussed moving the election results to item 9A and just switching that with the public hearing for accessory apartments since it will probably be a shorter agenda item. So that would be okay, moving so 10A. 10A to 9A. Uh, so 10B, I think, also. Yeah, there's been a request to move 10B forward. Okay. Okay, okay, so we'll move them up to right before 9A. Right. Yeah. Okay, any other changes? <coughs> There's been a request, I believe, for an executive session, which doesn't appear on the agenda. Okay, we'll do that um, right after the calendar. We also need to move uh, item 10C to a, um, I don't know if we want to continue. Okay, we just need to move that to December 1st. So we're going to continue it? Yeah, that's the Verizon wireless stuff. Uh, 
then we have to work that so. Okay. Any any other Oh, it's personnel. Uh, personnel. Okay, I'll entertain a motion uh, for those changes and then the agenda. I make the motion that we approve tonight's agenda with the motion to move item, agenda item 10A and B to uh, be presented before agenda item 9A, adding an executive session for personnel reasons and removing item 10C to December 1st meeting. Okay, a second. All right. Okay, so we have a motion by Sid and a second by Eric. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, on the consent items, we have the paid vouchers and the minutes. Do you want to have an open session prior to that? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I approved the open session and I skipped it. Yes, that'd be great. Let's uh, let's just finish the consent items and we'll do the open session. Any discussion on the consent? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I make the motion that we approve the consent agenda items. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Sid and second by Cindy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we'll now have an open session. For those that have just joined and they're still in the hall halls, hopefully you can hear. Um, if you're here for the accessory apartment discussion, uh, we're going to do that after we take care of items 10A and 10B, uh, excuse me, um, before 9A. And then we're going to get into the accessory apartments after 10A and 10B. And we may need to move into the... Um, the fire bays where they're currently working on setting up a sound system and chairs. Oh, we haven't started setting that up. Do you want us to start setting that Can up? Can you pull that trigger, yes. please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll have an open session now. If anyone's here to discuss an item that's not on the agenda or that's on the agenda and is not a public hearing item, Please come to the podium and please state your name and your address for the record. Hi, everybody. Lisa Lydiard, 1095 East Canyon D Lane. And yes, we own it now. <laughs> Somebody said, put that up and it's gone view. Um, question for you guys. Last week, during City Council, there was a section where, when we were talking about the, the Prop 1, and it was brought up, I think Sid brought it up, and said that there was a, a confusion on it. And when she, and I'll read what was said, but I'm the one that had written an article about it and I put the links to both these resolutions on it. So I spent the last week going through, uh, typing up the word for word from the council meetings back in January and then there was one in March and then there was a couple in June. And so I thought I better find, better. I need to have you clarify if that's okay. Um, I'll read what you said and then so you remember and then clarify to me because I'm wondering if I missed something. So um, when Diana was talking, she said at the very beginning when we were talking about these two new taxes increasing for road funds, we approved a version of a resolution without the UTA component and I'm surprised that the UTA version was put on the ballot. And then Sid said, speaking of UTA, there is confusion on how the council voted on Prop 1 earlier this summer. We voted to give the people a chance to vote on Prop 1 by asking the county to put it on the ballot. And we voted to remove the UTA component. That was not what was relayed to the public. And for the record, I just want to correct, the, uh, correct and then I couldn't hear what was said after that. I don't know what ended up. Tell me what you mean by that. If, um, so, so I, I don't see. have it in front of me what happened no, no, no. Yeah. about five months ago, so okay. I don't it's know okay. word for word. So what I was referring to is back in June we discussed Prop 1. What I what I am saying, the intent of at least my vote, and I'm assuming the others on the council except for, for Ben who voted differently, was that we wanted to <coughs> vote to give the people a chance to put it on the ballot and not support the UTA funding portion of Prop 1. We wanted more money to come back to the local municipalities. So I'd have to go back and review exactly what happened. When I read the resolution that was finished, there was talk about taking the UTA component out of the resolution, but it wasn't voted that way. And the resolution, 
um, they're still on the website actually in three different places and it hasn't been changed that second resolution the 2015-020 is what it's called on the city website mm -hmm. and it's in three places there's the staff report is the same and it's also in the minute notes it's attached there and then there's a place on the website that has resolutions on one page and for everyone that we've done this year and it's they're all the same and none of them they didn't strike it. They no. didn't exclude. Because I know. Can you comment on this, please? Well, all I can comment on is that I prepared one <clears throat> striking that language. There were two suggestions that were made. Okay. And so that's what should have been included. So I don't know what's posted. I think Kathy will have to probably go back to go back and see what the exhibit should have been. Okay. But I do remember, if you'll remember, you were probably here. Yeah. They <laughs> instructed us to, we talked about it one week, and they instructed staff to make those changes to, to remove the language of support for the UTA portion. And then there was one And then MAG happened. Change. I think the mayor went to MAG. I was there with you. Things changed because the mayors voted. You came back. But then at the beginning of that meeting, <coughs> You had said in there, some, I think the mayor said, did you strike, I actually have it in here, but I'll use my memory here. You had said, did you strike the UTA component? And you said, yes, you did. You said, yes, I did. But then as it went through, it wasn't, it got talked about a completely different way and redone a different way. Okay, well, I'll have to go back you and check? Look at a minute. Okay, thanks. And then Thank the you. links that I had to the resolutions when I put it out in the summer, I linked straight to those two Resolution so people could read them. So if there's a different one, we probably ought to get that correct. Okay, yeah, that would yeah. be great. If we correct it on our end and your links are still active, they should point to the same document. They should. And then I went back in, though, this week too, and I looked to see if anything, if the links, but then I went and searched the city website and they're still the same. Google so I don't know if there was another resolution. There should have been another resolution striking that section. Striking the UTA? Striking the support for the UTA. Okay. Because I didn't find it, so we, we'll maybe we can talk about it next. No, that's week or really something. helpful, actually, because it's during this last mm -hmm. month, um, it's been brought to my attention that we are on record as a city council for having supported the proposition with the UTA component, mm -hmm. and I think the minutes reflect that we did not support. It was very UTA. confusing <coughs> yeah. as I went back through it, and so I can see where. Because it would go one way, and, and I could see it. I, mean, I was like, okay, I was sat in there, and, that, and it was all over the place. So We apologize. Yeah, Thank so that you. would be great. Thank okay. you. Hey, Thanks a lot, Lisa. Lisa. <coughs> so if there's anyone else that would like to speak on an item that's not a public hearing, um, or not, on the, not part of the agenda, please state your name and address. For the record. Hi, well, my you. name's Clifford Sorensen, and I live at 1710 Blackhawk Circle, your NPG. Um, I actually came with one point, but I picked up a second in the process of doing my research. I came across an old Deseret News article from December of 2012, and at that point, PG was actually um, the 12th most indebted city in Utah, in absolute terms, not relative terms. And if you look at the ratio of income to uh, debt, I would I kind of ran it through my head. I didn't do all the calculations for all the cities they looked at, but I would guess Pleasant Grove is probably in the top one, two, or three. We we have about two and a half to three dollars worth of debt for every dollar of income we have. Um, that's just an aside. As I was after the elections were over, I started going through the the can, campaign contributions and the list. They're they're a little bit confusing, I think. Um, somebody from the city might have gone through them and, and checked them before they were published, but one of the things that struck me is the extraordinarily high amount of money that was donated by real estate interests. Um, one of our candidates took almost 86% of her um, campaign funding from real estate interests. Another took 80%, and uh, <coughs> one who isn't here tonight, I think, took around 75%. And given that real estate interests are so important in this town, I think it's just important to ask the people who, in, in fact, um, took that money to, I would personally prefer to see them recuse themselves when real estate questions came up. But that's probably impossible, but I think they should be identified in any conversation. And I'm referring to, Sid, as I looked at your figures, you took 
86% of the donations <coughs> in real estate. And Eric, I think, was, uh, he was the one just over 80%. Mm -hmm. And then Lynn Walker's was about 65%. And the big donors were the Utah Central Association of Realtors, the Fugles, St. John's, and then PG United, which actually turns out to be a pack of real estate people. They had $2,400. Uh, of the $2,400, 2000 was put in by the Fugel Corporation, <laughs> which makes them rival the, uh, the Association of Realtors, I guess, as the big donors for this election. Guys, did you happen to check who the main donor was for the PG3? Because he's a builder here in Pleasant Grove. So if we're going to compare the two... Well, you know, I looked at the winners rather than the losers, because the losers aren't going to be voting in the council election. If we're, if we're and, comparing campaigns, though, the big donor for the PG3 is a builder here in Pleasant Grove. I'll tell you about the Utah Realtors Association. We actually have a couple members of that association here tonight, but if you have questions, you can speak to them. They actually interview candidates from all over the county and for every election. The PG3 candidates were also, um, actually every candidate in our race was interviewed, and they selected the candidates they best felt represented homeowners across Pleasant Grove. They aren't realtors specifically that are selling land. They just represent homeowner, homeownership and rentals and a lot of different things in the city. Yeah, no, as a voter, I felt that I actually represented my homeowner interest probably better than a real estate association. That's that's but again, this is not to question anybody's honesty. I'm, I'm sure the members who were elected um, are as honest as anybody in the room. Um, but there's also a matter of appearances. You know, I was a management officer for State Department for many years, and in government, when you handle money, um, you have to be, as I say, purer than Caesar's wife, as the old saying goes. And I know in, in government, to receive this much money um, would actually exclude you from an action related to any kind of real estate. It actually thing. wouldn't. It would. I was there. I'm sorry. I, I served as a professional management officer for years, and the, the limits on what you can take from people you deal with in contracts are extreme, extreme. Um, I was there. I did it. I was a senior officer when I retired. I, I know what I'm talking about. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I just think that in any time, any, any time when uh, we're dealing with this kind of real estate issue, um, I think the people who have received so much money from the real estate associations, there's four, four major donors in here, should uh, <coughs> at least be known. Um, the citizens who are listening to the discussion should be aware that half the city council has received most of its donations from real estate associations, and I think that is something that people should be aware of simply in the matter of Clarity. That's all I have to say. But I'd like you to clarify because this is this is a serious claim that you're making an accusation. No, it's not a claim. No, it is. It's actual numbers on the paper. Well, it is, oh, but I think there's some people who are upset because they didn't get the funding and were interviewed, and others who they believed in us as candidates did fund. Campaign donations are not unusual, and you could say that about a private citizen. You could say that about a business. You could say that about anyone who donated to the campaigns. So campaign funding is not unusual. We disclose the amount. Would you like me to go back on Yes, I would, because I think the claim that you're making is it does question our integrity, and I would like to address that because I did not do anything wrong. It is not illegal or unethical to take money from an organization. This group of Utah realtors is a very uh, one, one. They're open. They have a board that interviewed each candidate, and they're very open. In fact, I'm trying to find the statement from Taylor Oldroyd. In fact, it's right here, and let me read this, what he sent to us, because I was concerned after I saw candidates bringing this up and trying to accuse us of unethical activities. So let me read you what he put. UCAR, the Utah County Association of Realtors, is a nonprofit organization that serves real estate professionals that live and work in 13 counties in Utah. As business owners, we care about public policy because we recognize that decisions made at the local, state, and federal level impact our pockets, budgets, and families. We work in partnership with communities to protect private property rights and promote a robust economy. A strong economy allows families to buy and sell real estate and reach the American dream. Home ownership is the key to building wealth, and studies demonstrate that home ownership is the backbone of the economy. It would be unwise of real estate professionals to ignore government, especially at the local level, when the real estate is your profession and politics is your business. They, they support home ownership, they support private property rights. And no, those are wonderful things. I have nothing else to say. I think it's a, it's a matter of simple transparency. We, as I stated openly, that? I stated openly that I think the members who were elected are as honest as anybody else in the room. So this does not stand as an accusation against your honesty. It's a matter of transparency. And, we so, that and, and we I will also that. point out that uh, UCOR was not necessarily the biggest donor. The Fugel Corporation, through PG United and through its own donations, rivals 
it actually it, it does. So I just want, I would like to make sorry. I just went through the figures. I spent hours going through them. Um, PG United had twenty four hundred dollars to spend. Two thousand of those dollars came from Hugo Hugo okay. Corporation. And, and every candidate had donations made. I'm not they sure did. What the and I'm, I agree. It's I say it as a beginning. It's a matter of transparency. There will and be a lot of discussion that, of. I've got the documents, right. I did, and I looked at them, and I suspect a lot of people have it. It's just a matter that people should know that there were very, very strong real estate influences from a couple of very large groups in this election. It's not illegal. Utah does not have any limitations whatsoever on campaign donations in any amount or in any percentage. So if that's what you're suggesting, so I'm I, implying I'm not. I would like to also make a comment. This has been going on for years. Um, when you say I, this, what are you referring uh, to? Donations from this organization, this nonprofit organization, has been going on. I probably believe the mayor, in his time of election, myself, Van, all of, everyone that has probably run for office, as Sid said, they interview all the candidates in every city. Well, you're focusing on one group. There were four major donors. And again, I don't object to anybody participating. I, I donated myself. Right. The objection is to simply a lack of transparency. I don't think a lot of people spend a lot of time going through um, the donation sheets. In fact, I would guess most of the people in this room have not. Uh, the ones from uh, um, PG United are particularly hard to find because you've got to chase it around through the Utah state government. And they were major donors as well. As I said, there were four major real estate donors, not just the one. And I merely bring this up. Group. It's a group of citizens. And Mr. Sorensen, this is available. It's completely transparent. I reported every penny that I received as I was required to by law. Yes, They're you do. available I've got it right on the city website. So when you see a lack of transparency, that's not accurate. And you are calling into question our integrity right here and now. And I'm telling you, there was nothing dishonest done, at least, and not on my part. I did everything to the penny, and that's transparent on the website. It is exactly so as you say and I never accused you of any wrongdoing. I think that's why you're standing I merely now. said, in the interest of transparency, people should realize that, that a significant portion of the campaign finance came from real estate donors. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. And that's okay. all I have to say. Okay. Christy Belt, 266 East. Um, I don't know if the water person's in here. Are they in here? Or did they leave? Who's in charge of water? Yeah, Marty's uh, <coughs> going be here in a minute. Marty's out waving. He's in the hall. I just want to say thank you. I know you guys probably get beat up sometimes. I just went from spending an oodle, and I won't tell you how much water, city water I've been wasting. Um, but they helped me find a leak in my yard um, that was culinary water leaking out into my yard. So I paid for every cent, every half gallon that I've wasted. But they came out on Saturdays. I didn't know there were uh, on the call, on call Saturday water guys. There are fabulous. They came out twice. They helped us figure it out. They have been, and earlier this year, someone else came out. I just want to say they've been so helpful to us this year. Um, we're saving a lot of money now. Thank you. We need it. Um, but I just wanted publicly to thank the water people for helping just everyday Joe citizens like me. Thanks. Like to address the council in open session. <laughs> Lane Thatcher, 120 North, 1400 East. Um, we've gotten off to a rousing start already. Uh, this is Pleasant Grove is at a crossroads. <coughs> Uh, last week, I took the opportunity to speak a little bit about the divide in our city and uh, the fact that we have an opportunity, I believe, to remove or to help remove that divide. Um, already in open session, we've had a couple of items discussed that appear to me uh, to be examples of items that are continuing to foster this divide. And uh, I think we need to discuss these just a little bit. Um, with reference to the correcting of the record last week uh, in city council meeting, with information that appears to be false, 
I think is quite concerning. Um, when you look at what was actually voted upon in the resolution to support Proposition 1, um, I think it's very clear what you were aware of, what you knew, and what you actually voted on. Most of our city leaders were counting on the tax increase <coughs> from Proposition 1 uh, to provide more money for road funding here. The Lynn Walker, Eric Jensen, and Sid Lamone campaigns all campaigned on Proposition 1 being part of their plan to fix our roads. To try and correct the record about your support for Proposition 1 as written, I believe is a deception to the people of Pleasant Grove. This kind of deception is not becoming of our city leaders, and I believe must stop. There is a widening credibility gap with our appointed <coughs> elected officials. Last year, most people in Pleasant Grove realized that the public safety building proposal was outrageously expensive. <coughs> we were told over and over through the year that this was the only way to solve these needs. And we were also told that it was the most cost-effective way to solve these needs. <coughs> This was simply not true. You have considerable information currently in your hands that shows multiple options to completely meet our public safety needs at a fraction of the cost proposed last year. These examples of creating the credi credibility gap, these are examples of creating the credibility gap and are actions that are creating and I believe perpetuating the divide. I feel obligated to point this out and to make the case for and plead for a different course of action. Why would we want to continue down this path and further divide our city? We do not have to continue to take this path. There is another way. We can be completely honest with the citizens. We can live within our means. We can operate in a cost-efficient manner. We can meet our needs in this city without raising taxes. <coughs> I plead with our administrators and our elected leaders. Choose to change course. Choose to actually represent the citizens in an open and honest manner. <clears throat> we cannot afford to go down the path of other agendas. Please recognize that most people in the city want our elected officials to be honest with us. Want the city to live within its means want our city to operate in a cost-efficient manner. Most citizens do not want their taxes raised. Most citizens want less regulation and more protection of our liberties. The citizens of Pleasant Grove implore our leaders to take stock of the election results and look closely at the methods used by our leaders to retain power. This is a fragile result. If you continue down this path, it will likely not end well. We call for you to be responsive to our citizens. We say unequivocally, there is another way. You have the option to show true leadership, to lead by implementing true and correct principles. Please embrace the principles of honesty and integrity, the principle of liberty, and the principle of living within our means. We have enough revenues to meet our needs here in Pleasant Grove. Please live within those revenues. If we follow the path we are on and continue to do things that divide us as a city, the divide will only widen and we will develop a deeper and deeper mistrust for our government and our leaders. 
This is not what the citizens of Pleasant Grove want. The citizens want to trust their leaders. If you change course, the divide will disappear rapidly. You could be considered heroes for dissolving the divide. You could take credit for restoring cost-efficient operation of a wonderful city. Please choose to change course. Choose to help remove the divide. Choose to represent the citizens. <coughs> Choose to live within our means. Choose not to increase our taxes. And please, choose to protect our liberty. Thank you. Emily Varney, 1756 North, 390 West. Um, I just want to go on record as saying that Wayne Thatcher does not represent my view as a citizen, and I feel like the vote and the election stands on its own, and that that result indicates what the majority of Pleasant Grove citizens want. I appreciate the integrity of the candidates who won, and thank you for your willingness to serve. like to speak during the open session. So I did bring a speaker <coughs> speech, and it says feisty. <laughs> kind of what I'm feeling, and I was going to give to Dion, because it's a shout out to him, because um, the bathrooms look fabulous at the rec center. <laughs> Molly and Andrew, 1125 Sage Drive. Anyway, I want, this is a shout out to Dion, and I'll get back to him when it comes. Um, my first note is, I am a citizen of Pleasant Grove, and Blaine Thatcher doesn't represent my opinion either. And when we talk about the road of going down to public safety, the committee really hasn't reached a decision yet, and we are, we are exploring several, several different options. And if anybody wants to attend, the RFPs come back tomorrow, and they're back. We've already looked at them, and we'll discuss them tomorrow, <coughs> and that might be a great opportunity to have a voice also. They're open meetings to the citizens, and just know that a decision has not been made on that. So also, uh, PG United is not a group of realtors. We donated $423.37 to each campaign, and we used that other money to do service projects and other things. Brandon Fugel did donate that $2,000 to PG United. I am a housewife, I am a preschool teacher, I am a mom, I am not a realtor. Um, Drew is the only realtor on PG United that <laughs> serves with us. So Can I show you the figures? I have the figures, I turned them in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, um, answering for Sid and Eric and Lynn to the Realtors Association, I don't think in general just because they're the winners. Um, you want to know who they're going to answer to. If PG3 had won, are you aware of who they would answer to? I know their largest donation was $250. Their largest donation was Night West at $1993.50. Utah Valley Home Builders was $1,500. St. John Properties was $1,500. Cooney Landscaping was $1,126. And Frank Anderson was $995.31. So and those were together, I could group these okay. together as well and come up with similar. If we could you could, direct, but we didn't run together. Let's, let's uh, all can we direct Dion's not back. The attention here, I would please? give it to him. Just speak anyway. to the council. Thank you. That's all I have. I just want to correct that. I'm not going to sit and let everything go this time. Thanks, Molly. Thanks. If anyone has a question and would like to look this up, um, at the top of the June 6, <coughs> 2015 Council Meeting Minutes, page 14, first paragraph. Last week when the matter was discussed, Attorney Peterson was instructed <coughs> to remove the portion stating that the city was supportive of it being included on the November 2015 election ballot. Um, and this is talking specifically about the UTA portion, or it should have said the UTA portion. So I can see where the confusion is coming from in reference to what, uh, what Blaine is saying. And so I'm going to ask that we go back and take a look at that and make a correction to those minutes to reflect what's on the audio. Thank you. Yes. Carl Cooney, 2115 North, Crestwood Boulevard. 
I am the owner of Kumi Landscaping. I was a large donor for PG3, and I would like to state, sorry, I'm furious. I would just like to state on the record that I was not running for city council and that um, the PG3 were not beholden to me. I would like to publicly state on the record that every time I heard a rumor created by a female incumbent candidate that regarded me or my company, my company donated. And if we would like that to continue, my company will continue to donate. What are you talking Thank about? Thank you very much. No, you know, I've sat quiet most of this campaign, but when someone gets up and questions my integrity and honesty as a human being and a person, that's when I start having a problem. I don't even know what you're talking about that I questioned your, your landscaping company. And Carl, I won't even get into some of the things that happened because I do have integrity and I'm not even going to go there. But when people from the public stand up in a public meeting with this many people here and go on record questioning my integrity, I'm very frustrated and I'm very hurt right now. I am I'm a, you said the female incumbent, I'm the only I one. Come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> that was a cheap yeah. shot. And I'm tired of the cheap yeah. shots that have been taken at me and my family for the past six months. And I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to sit here and be called dishonest. And I, I, I just defended I'm not my company person, and I will defend response myself. to Amy. I just defended I'm my company. But you don't need to get up and take a cheap shot at me. I didn't say anything about you. Design. Uh, criteria for the area. Yes, we did, and it, it, it's something I feel like it made the store a lot better. Um, and I think it's going to be nice for the community. We we appreciate you coming to town and also accommodating the requests. Certainly. Thank you. Welcome Any to Welcome to Pleasant Grove. Well, thank you. <coughs> okay. If there's no further discussion, then I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion, Mayor, that we approve the request of Market <coughs> Express for a site plan approval for. 1,200 square foot convenience store with an eight-pound fuel station operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and selling alcohol and tobacco and bubble gum. I'll second that. Did they say bubble gum? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1679 West State Street in the Grove Zone Commercial Sales Up District. Okay. Motion by Ben, second by Eric, by voice. Diana? Yes. Cindy? Yes. Eric? Yes. Sid? Yes. Ben? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. May you sell a lot of whatever you sell. <laughs> when is the expected construction going to be completed? When is it expected to open? Um, probably won't get started until March. Okay. It takes about three months to complete one. So <coughs> okay. We look forward to ribbon cutting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was item 10A and 10B. We're going to go back now to item 9A, and this is a public hearing to consider for adoption in ordinance 2015-46 for a proposed text amendment regarding accessory apartments creating city code section 10-15-47 and amending sections 10-6-2 Definitions 10-9A-2 Permitted Conditional and Accessory Uses 10-9B-2 Permitted Conditional and Accessory Uses 10-9C-2 Permitted Conditional and Accessory Uses and 10-14-24-2C Permitted and Conditional Accessory Uses Permitting Accessory Apartments in the Pleasant Grove City Code. Ken? Okay, uh, I'll just start off uh, with a little um, preface here on, on our uh, presentation here tonight. I did have the city planner, Royce Davies, uh, update this a little bit. I have been out of town until just uh, before the meeting. I have not had a chance to go through the presentation, so it will be a surprise to both of us. Not really a surprise. I know basically what's in there, so if I stumble, over, please forgive me. Uh, so going back to, uh, I, I won't give a lot of history here, but uh, the city has been working on this issue for about 15 years now, on and off. There have been a few different proposals that have come in the form of an ordinance format uh, for the city, and uh, for one reason or another, it was not uh, it, it tends to be an issue that does not go away. There, uh, there is a lot of concern, 
that has been expressed to staff and to um, council planning commission in public meetings that uh, there is a need for a, a way to have permitted accessory apartments. We've also had concerns expressed to the city that uh, people who live in single family neighborhoods who bought into single family neighborhoods do not like or appreciate the idea of having uh, accessory apartments in their neighborhood and, and do not support this. This has kind of been the battle that's gone on for a long time. Uh, we have seen um, over the years in a few different surveys that there is a majority of opinion that supports the permitting of accessory apartments. <coughs> Um, but exactly how to do that is where it further uh, gets into complications. There are those who wish to see uh, permitted uh, accessory apartments without any kind of regulation. <coughs> do whatever you want, however many units you want. Don't worry about parking <coughs> or what type of access is or anything like that. Just let us do what we want. 100% property rights. Then there's those who feel like, well, let's just have minimal regulation that... Um, <coughs> is for safety. Then there's others that really would like to have a lot of regulation. So it's just, it's, it's all over the board. But uh, it, it does seem to be that at least in the camp of please permit them uh, is a majority opinion. So with that, um, I will go through uh, what we have and what has been presented to the Planning Commission. And I'll just mention up front the Planning Commission recommended approval, not unanimously. There was one <coughs> commissioner who did not uh, give their support. Uh, so, uh, let's see. So, <coughs> here we, we have <laughs> just a visual on accessory apartments uh, not being permitted and have not been since uh, 1985 as part of the city code. So, by so saying, it has in the past been permitted. And there are places and, and there are accessory apartments that were built under a permit uh, of the city uh, that uh, are currently still in use. Um, but in 1985, the, the city adopted a new code that uh, no longer allowed for that. And so uh, through the years, the only provisions that have been made is that in certain areas where multifamily is permitted, uh, and then in the downtown village zone, uh, there have been accommodations to allow for these types of uses in certain zones. But in the uh, single family residential zones, it still remains not permitted and has remained so since 1985. <coughs> since 2000, the year 2000, is when discussions came up again as to maybe we should re-look at this and, and find a way to permit it. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of this. Got some good visuals here, but We'll just get to the meat here. Okay, I, I think this is a good point. Um, and in your staff report, I'm not going to review all the detail, but there, there are um, a lot of opportunities for housing throughout Utah County. But there is, um, as you look at the, the, income, the, the demographics for income in our community and in, throughout uh, Utah County, there, there does show a need for affordable housing. And even in, in Pleasant Grove, where we have a large percentage of multifamily housing, we still do not necessarily have that same percentage in affordable housing. <coughs> because a lot of the new condos and apartments that are currently being rented or sold do not meet the qualification of affordable housing. This is a way to, to allow for our children who grow up in Pleasant Grove and cannot yet on their first home or their second home afford to buy a home, afford to buy a condo. It allows them an opportunity to live in our basements. And uh, I think a lot of times we uh, tend to think that uh, accessory apartments are, are lived in by those people, but those people by and large are our people, our families, that need to have affordable living situations. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to get into all of that unless there are questions. We can talk about uh, the income and, and the cost of housing. So we'll just get to the, I'm sure our, our city planner would love to have explained all of these <coughs> points here. So there are uh, permitted zones that, uh, or allow zones that do permit it currently. 
So aspects of the ordinance that is proposed include that an entrance must not allow for a duplex appearance. <coughs> so we, don't, we can't have it look like a duplex. There's two doors. It looks like a divided house. We're not, we're not permitting a, a duplex appearance. Ad addressing should be A and B for the units, for the primary and the apartment units. The, uh, there should be six off-street parking spaces required. And let me explain that. There's, uh, I have been party to some discussions that seem to have not understood exactly what that means. Currently, all single-family <coughs> homes in Pleasant Grove are required to have four off-street parking. That would, uh, that would include your garage. That would count up to two, two parking stalls if you had a two-car garage. <coughs> and you have a driveway in front of that. There's two more. So that's the four. That's how single-family homes meet the four. Uh, so what we are requiring is just two more. If you're going <coughs> to have a, a accessory apartment, you're going to invite a new family <coughs> to join yours under the same roof or on the same lot, who will most likely have their own vehicles, usually more than one. It makes sense to require additional parking for them as well. Now, there are those situations where uh, in a single family home, it's a, uh, a single person, uh, perhaps a widow or something that needs to rent out their apartment. And so perhaps the parking need is not as great for that particular person at that particular time. However, we need to provide for requirements that cover all potential situations <coughs> in that house on that property. So when that single person leaves, sells, and someone else buys it, a family with four kids, they have three cars, four cars, then we have an accessory apartment where we rent to another family that have two cars. We're going to need that, those two extra parking spaces. Yes, there are situations where that parking is not needed, but in city planning, in city regulations, we try to provide for all situations. What is the potentiality? The potentiality could actually exceed six. But I think this is kind of more a typical average type of a situation that we would be looking at. <coughs> Living area must be separate from the principal unit. So in other words, they have their own entrance, they have their own sleeping, their own uh, sanitation, kitchen facilities and such. Uh, building code must be met. So if uh, uh, an apartment wants to become registered to be permitted with the city, if there are certain building uh, code issues that need to be taken care of, they will need to take care of those. If it's a new apartment that's being built, then Hang they, on, of course, please. need to meet. If there are people in the hall that would like to share, we have maybe eight, eight or nine chairs in here. You're being invited to a couple of here, a couple of here. Raise your hand if you have an empty seat next to you, please. And then there's three <laughs> So an interior access must be, ma ma excuse me, be maintained between the two units. For emergency service purposes, there needs to be have there needs to have that uh, additional access. So it can be a locked door, but there needs to be a door between the two, the principal unit and the accessory. Apartments cannot be sold. <coughs> Apartments must be registered. Uh, the uh, ordinance is proposing a $25 one-time registration fee to cover the inspections. A two-year period will start if the ordinance is approved that allows for registration. So in other words, anybody who has currently an accessory apartment will need to register with the city within two years from the time we adopt this ordinance. If they do not, the last bullet point there is failure to register after this period will result in a potential fine of $1,000. So we're going to do our utmost best to advertise this requirement. And we're going to give a full two-year period for everyone to find out and to become registered. 
If at that time they choose not to be registered, well, we'll have to deal with that uh, at that point. But we do need to have this registration. If the city is going to be in the situation or the business of regulating uh, these uh, accessory requirements, then we need we have taken upon us a bit of liability. And if we don't enforce <coughs> it and we don't uh, see that th things are being done correctly and properly, then, then that can come back to bite us. So I think it behooves us to actually follow up uh, on those who, either for one reason or another, uh, have not registered. So. Uh, again, it's not requiring that fine to be in place. It's just allowing the city to to do that if that's necessary. Home occupation businesses uh, with no customer traffic are permitted in, a, in an accessory apartment with property owners. Do they have a store with the city, the, the home business? Home business. Well, of course, they will have to get a business license okay. through the city. So they go through the same process. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. So, we already did that one. All right, chair up here. So, th those are the key points of the ordinance that uh, is being proposed. As mentioned, uh, we've gone through a, a very lengthy process in reviewing this, and uh, staff feels very comfortable that this is a good ordinance. Is it perfect? No. Is this going to perfectly cover all situations? No. I don't know that there's any code <coughs> that can do that. But I think we've made a very good attempt to create a code that will cover a situation that is ongoing. We do have, we are aware that there are many accessory apartments in the community currently. And to go on continually not permitting them and making them outlaw situations, I do not believe is responsible of the city. We, we need to do something. They're not going to go away if we say you're not permitted. They will continue. We need to be in the business of regulating. My understanding is that the city council was looking at this from the perspective of health, safety, and welfare. Yes. Okay. We can do that, or we can open it up to the public. What would you prefer? Public first. Um, and I don't know if this is the time, but I would like to be perfectly honest here. I actually have a daughter and a son-in-law that live in an accessory apartment in the house. So I don't know if... Uh, it's, if it's a daughter and a son, family. it's family, it's, it's not family. considered... That, that would be considered a mother-in-law family. Let me, let me clarify that for everybody here. Uh, we do currently permit family situations. We do require, if you're going to have a second kitchen in your home, in other, in other words, you could have a full separate apartment. But if it contains a kitchen, and it's the second kitchen in the home, we, we require that the property owner sign an affidavit saying that this is not to be used to be rented out to other people than family. So it's considered a mother-in-law apartment. Uh, all we're saying currently in our code is <coughs> you can't rent that apartment out to someone you're not related to. Okay. Did anyone else want to disclose anything? <laughs> you know me. I like to disclose. <laughs> I'm sorry. My house is too small for it. So okay. Sorry. Anybody else want to comment or ask questions? All right. Let's open it up to the public. Um, you're all welcome to express your comments on this. Um, if it looks like a lot of people want to express it, try to limit your the amount of speech to you know something reasonable. And then, um, and if you have if you have a re repetitious comment that someone's already made. Maybe just make reference to it so that we can kind of tidy it up. You will need to state your name and address for the record. Okay. <coughs> Michael Butt, 936 North, 440 West. Uh, regarding this issue, there's some things I would like to point out, and I'm going to use the FAQ that is provided on the city website regarding this issue uh, in my comments, um, as well as the, the notes of the <coughs> council meeting from March 24th of this year. Um, wanted to point out, um, as has been mentioned, the uh, previous surveys <coughs> that have been submitted since 2009, and it was stated in that city council meeting in March 
that staff was of the opinion that the public had ample opportunity to express their questions and concerns. Uh, I would agree with that also. Um, I don't know why uh, things were not acted upon uh, at that time. Uh, it's, it's lamentable that there wasn't more um, people who uh, involved themselves uh, in that survey. It's lamentable there's only 33% that vote for city elections. But we don't halt city elections you know, based on that. But in the FAQ, it states, for example, regarding this, that, sorry, ah, three surveys to date have been performed to garner public opinion uh, input on the AA <coughs> issue, none of which would be considered statistically accurate. So I, I kind of pose, you know, why. Um, I, I disagree with, with that statement. It says the majority seems to support the permitting of AA which then it says ultimately it may be an issue that requires an informed decision to be made based on the facts and needs as they relate to the health, <coughs> safety, and welfare, welfare goals of the community rather than based on the opinions of people with limited awareness of the pertinent facts and issues. Uh, this was FAQ number 10, by the way. And the mayor stated that this is what we're basing on. So I have a question that I open to the staff and council together. Does the city have a statistical report where data has been compiled at least since 2009 that demonstrates that the health, safety, or welfare of citizens has been compromised in direct relation to the existence of an accessory apartment? Do we have any such record? Are you aware, Scott? I don't think we've uh, done a study or anything. Uh, maybe referring to you know ambulance calls or things like that. We have issues with that. Um, we haven't reviewed our calls to say this was basically because of an accessory apartment or anything like that. I don't think I, it's it, been tabulated yeah. in in finite numbers. Uh, the council did rely on input from our public safety personnel with respect to what occurs when they go <coughs> into a home that has an, an accessory apartment and they have to access it through the home and try to figure out where to go. And so we've relied on their um, input as to what they experience. But okay. tabulation? No. Tabulation, no. no. Okay, so I, I submit that with, in the absence of such a report, it's difficult as a citizen to be informed, as, as is suggested here, um, and our awareness is then limited. And for me, it, I then fall back on my ideology. I'm a conservative constitutionalist, which in part means that I believe what Amendment 9 says, that those rights enumerated in the Constitution are not meant to construe that other retained rights of people are to be denied or disparaged. So. I also want to point out that in this FAQ number nine, there are only two options that are stated. Number one, specifically define, regulate, and permit accessory apartments, or two, expressly prohibit them in certain zones. And I submit, and again, following uh, what was stated in the council meeting in March by Director Young, three <coughs> potential responses, a no, a yes without regulation, and a yes with some regulation. And so I submit for myself that I would like there to be the specifically define and permit accessory apartments without regulation on the FAQ. <coughs> I, I, I think the FAQ should have been updated based on those comments made in that council meeting, but I'm just stating that there should be that option of we should define it without regulation. And again, I just fall on my ideology about regulation, and government regulation and bureaucracy, in the absence of having any 
<coughs> specific data that shows that there is a true issue. Otherwise, we're going on perception. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I used to say, if your analysis is merely a mixture of theory, conjecture, and expectations, your result will be a fabulous recipe for pie in the sky. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Can we, can we please, I, I don't mean to be rude, I just, let's not do the applause thing, okay? Thank you. Vaughn Mayo, 50 North, 1300 East. Uh, as a real estate investor, uh, I've tr addressed the city council on this issue before. And when I talked or listened to the planning commission meeting last week, it came down to that this, that you're trying to do with the auxiliary apartments. I'm in favor of the auxiliary apartments being allowed. Um, but I have a problem with all of the regulation stuff. Uh, first, it's a voluntary thing, unless you're going to add a lot of staff to check <coughs> and send out notices to all the people buying property in the city every week and sending out inspectors every week, you're not going to be able to enforce this. And so they said it's basically complaint oriented. <coughs> okay? I only heard some of the comments that were being stated earlier before I came into the room. The last thing we need in this community is a bunch of complaints that would divide the city, okay? As a real estate investor and a property owner, I have on occasion received anonymous letters regarding one of my properties. I recently got one. In fact, I've gotten two on the same house from the same person. It's an anonymous letter with all kinds of facts that they're throwing out that are erroneous, okay? As a landlord, it's my responsibility to check these things out. How does my tenant feel when I approach them and say, hey, you know, a neighbor's saying that you've got, you know, a couple other families living here and you've got people living in the trailer in the driveway. And they're going like, no, we don't have anybody. You can go look at the trailer. We're working on refurbishing the trailer. There's nobody living in it. How do they feel about their neighbors? This is an, un, you know, unnamed thing. I wanted to bring the letter with me, but then I thought, no, that would take too much time. But I wanted to share one other experience with you because, to me, this is an unenforceable set of regulations. We already have building codes. <coughs> we already have parking codes. We already have so many things in place. Why do we need any more? Wouldn't it be easier just to take the wording out that says that auxiliary apartments are not allowed and get rid of that and leave the other regulations alone? But several years ago, a lot of you in this room are LDS. Okay, I am too. A lot of years ago, as a member of a bishopric, I was asked by the bishop to put a, a single lady and her kids in one of my houses because she could not afford a decent house in a decent neighborhood. I was asked to put her in at a lower reduced rent than what the house would normally receive. Five years later, she was still paying the same rent. My taxes had gone up, my insurance had gone up, my negative cash flow on the property had gone up, and my income had gone down. I had to raise the rent, $50, which was still substantially below it. I received an anonymous letter from somebody in my ward telling me that I was the scum of the earth and everything bad, okay? Sid, maybe you can relate to it from the comments that I kind of heard you say. How do you think I felt walking into church each Sunday think, knowing somebody thought so little of me for doing something nice because they didn't know? This is what this is going to do to our city because people, you know, somebody's going to complain about somebody and they're going to get upset and they go, well, what about so and so and so and so and so and so? And it's going to perpetuate more problems. I would ask you, I mean, I can go on about other things on it, but this is not enforceable. You penalize people for exercising their own property rights. I mean, who lives in my house is not your business, and who lives in yours is not my business, okay? I mean, as a landlord, I have to be careful who I put in my single-family houses, okay? And I would encourage people to be careful about who they rent to. But something like this is unenforceable to start with, and I think that was basically said. There's, there's so much to it that cannot be 
totally taken and controlled, and it's going to cause nothing but contention and problems. So I encourage you to just leave our regulations we have and strike that that's illegal to have that apartment. Thank you. Thank you. That's one. Anyone else? I'm Craig Ryrie. I'm 141 West, 2600 North in Pleasant <coughs> But uh, I was here at the previous uh, city council meeting uh, when this was brought up. And I was really quite surprised at the lack of compassion uh, that I saw. And I want to echo what was just said, is that uh, most of these people that live in apartments, uh, it's really out of their control. Uh, I remember during the last real economic problem that we had here. Uh, my wife was a new society president. And there were people that were in their homes. And, uh, and they, they could only see their way around it by uh, <coughs> inviting someone to share in, in the cost by renting out their basement. And we had some people in the ward that complained, you know, about that that's not fair and stuff like that. And so I agree that I think we just should open the door and, and we have compassion. And at the last meeting that I was here, it was, I was very discouraged because I heard, I don't know what her name was, but a lady from the city, and they said, well, what if people don't comply? Well, we make a big fine. And $1,000 was brought up, and then they even mentioned, I think, $2,500 for the second offense. <coughs> And things like that, and, and I didn't move to Pleasant Grove to have that. <coughs> I, I agree with what was just recommended, that, that we just have compassion and understanding for people that are really trying to hang on to their homes. And it isn't over for now, even though we have a lot of nice homes here in Pleasant Grove. Uh, there are a lot of people really struggling, and I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt to, to have compassion, and if there are problems of uh, non-compliance with the uh, whatever improvements have to be made for this for safety, uh, that can be addressed in, in some way. I don't know how. It was also brought up at that meeting, which was almost funny. Uh, they said that this has been in effect in uh, or for two years. I don't remember. I didn't write it down. But, that it has been, uh, that is mandatory to register. And then they ask how many have registered. And I think they said about 200 or, or less. <laughs> Out of the whole city of Orem, you know there are a few more rented apartments than that. And I think we'll have the same thing here. And the only way we can do it is a Gestapo type of thing, of going around, sneaking around, or having the members of the city council going around in their cars, seeing who is at variance, and pretty soon we're just trying to sniff out problems to make money. That's the way I got it from my last meeting, is this facility is trying to make money on the, on the um, uh, penalties that would surely arise. And I don't know, I hope that isn't what we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Moon, uh, 895 South, 1550 East. I am very much in support of a change, and for the most part of the, the, the way it's been put together, there are a few wording changes that I think need to be made. And they come as a result of sitting on the committee last spring that went through this and put a proposal together. And as we discussed this, um, We discussed the ins and outs and, and, and everything and tried to take everything into account. All the reasons for, all the reasons against. We, we, I was surprised that we were able to, to really look at it from, from all perspectives. Um, I know one of the things that uh, I was very much in favor of is, you know, that the doing something about addresses and the AD system certainly takes care of the issue so that the police and the fire department and ambulance have the 
opportunity to get to the right place. I know that is an, an, an issue, and hopefully is a driving factor in, in making a change and recognizing that the accessory apartments exist because there is a lot of them, and most of us have a neighbor with an accessory apartment. We may not know it. I have neighbors that, that had them, and I didn't realize it. Um, it's not like having a duplex. It, it, by having an owner-occupied building, it is kind of self-police. the type of people that are renting. You know, if they're if they're making noise, if they're um, destroying the property, if, if they are trashing the, the, the lot, you're going to get rid of them because you live there and you want to take pride in your property. And you can be picky about the type of people that you allow to live there. So these are different than you know allowing duplexes and things. And it's a very much a mandatory source of income for some people, divorced people, widows, widowers, people that uh, lose a, a job and things that have been mentioned. In saying that I'm very much in support of it. I do think there's a few changes that need to be made in the, the proposal. Um, I think on line C, and I don't know if you have them to look at it or not, but um, it kind of gets an open <coughs> and number of people that can live in that accessory apartment. And so I wonder if we don't want to somehow limit that. Um, excuse me, it's not C. D, number two on D. Um, you know, two or more adults or persons related, and then adding children. Um, it, it's, if you read that whole thing, it just it opens it up so kind of an unlimited number of people could, could be there. And I think maybe some wording changes could help. Also, on um, P, dealing with the registration as it goes through there. Which letter? On P. <coughs> it, it, it lists a lot of, you know, if you're, if you're going to build a home, if you're going to remodel, if you're going to do something to create the apartment, but we have a lot of existing apartments that aren't addressed there and how they're going to be handled. So I think there's a wording change that is, is needed there to, to bring those into compliance. And under P, 1 and 2 probably were intended for existing apartments to be included in it, but on 3 and 4, I certainly hope people with existing apartments don't have to take out a building permit and go through that process and the inspections and whatnot. I can make a great argument for why all these existing apartments need to be installed. <coughs> um, on the other hand, I think that's kind of the downfall and pitfall in making the ordinance change is that if you start requiring inspections, no one's going to step forward and, and do this. Um, but I also under, understand why the city feels a need for it. And that, you know, that I, I think most people are fearful that if they register, at some point they're going to be taxed specifically because of that apartment. <laughs> there is that fear factor there for a lot of people. Um, personally, I'm kind of in favor of, of registration. But I think as you read through here, it's a little bit ambiguous as to what happens to those existing apartments and how they're handled. Um, And I think that's the points that I have, but I am very much in support of, of making the change, and I think that for the most part, this is very good. <coughs> Stab at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service on that committee. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, Stan Williams, 175 South, 1300 East. Um, there was one thing on this page that bothered me a lot. When we were talking about it uh, last Thursday, the failure to register after this period will result in a thousand dollar as could be, and I I don't like that uh, solid will be. I think that should be could. That be. was that was also stated yeah. tonight the way you presented. It. 
Yeah, and, and that's incorrect up on the screen there. The actual order uh, it says that it could be. Uh, or let's see, I'll read it. It says um, this ordinance, okay, I better back up. Failure to complete the registration of an existing accessory partner within two years of the passing of this ordinance may result in a fine of $1,000, which may <coughs> result in a lien on the property. So let's make sure the correct language is the one that's posted so we don't end up like we did on the other one. Just so you know, Mayor, I did a little research. I'm not <coughs> sure that there was a mistake. Oh, really? So okay. I'll find Thank you. Here. What did she say? Well, I'm just a little concerned with the extent of that, actually, with being kind of open-ended on it. I, okay. It just kind of feels like we're getting back to what some of them mentioned as the Gestapo-type feeling. Okay, so um, there was another thing that on the parking, why does that have to be so, so complicated? If we just require enough off-street parking for each vehicle <coughs> that's in that residence or residences, there shouldn't be an issue. When snow removal time comes, if they're not off the street, then it becomes an issue and it's just like it is right now. Um, my other concern is uh, I'm in favor of me being able to have one. I've lived in an R1 for nine years and have not had one. But I would guess in our ward, and I don't think I'm guessing, I would believe that there are eight or more in our ward. Okay, so, yeah, we've got a lot of them out there. But the one concern that I have is that Look around, we've got a lot of elderly people and getting older in this in this city. And a lot of us want to stay here. And if I can't have one, I may not be able to stay here. I just don't feel like that the emphasis on the incomes and stuff we were talking about, these younger couples and younger families, a lot of us older ones are going to have to do something with our large homes. I don't see why we should be restricted. So, you know, as far as... Uh, that goes, I, I just don't want to feel like I'm limited to my being able to provide for my retirement or staying here. So, anyway, thank you. Lisa Whittier, 1095 East Canyon New Lane. The mayor will be glad that I wrote this, so I'm not going off the cuff. <laughs> um, I'd like I to see them. So. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> like to see them legal, with very little if no regulation outside what's in the code. According to this proposed new regulation, the citizens will be forced to register, and they'll be forced to pay a twenty-five dollar <coughs> or more um, fee to do it. And then they will have two years to register, or they'll be forced to pay a fine, and they'll be their property could be leaned. I don't believe in having any of those in there. A home inspection is going to come with the registration, we believe. We're not sure what will be inspected, how, what are, are they gonna base it off of the new code? <coughs> oh, it's not really put in, in very well in the wording. Um, registration and regulation for accessory apartments is based <laughs> on this law by money changing hands. Currently, the citizens are allowed to have their family rent out part of the home as apartment as long as no money is changing hands, like a mother-in-law apartment. Collecting rent <coughs> should not be based um, a basis for creating law and regulations. Citizens should have the right to own and use their property. They can choose what to do what they want with their property as long as they are not infringing upon their neighbor's right to do the same. The city has combined the code uh, um, with existing illegal accessory apartments with new ones that are following a building code permit. So they're putting it together. And I think that that, the regulations will be the same, but I don't think that that's going to work because it can be very expensive for them to have an existing one if they have to conform to new building codes, like a width of a staircase or we're talking about windows and because the building codes that we have today in 2015 are way different than what a lot of people have. So I think it's going to put a really big burden on people that have them already. Um, popular today, we have what's called complaint-based law. The cities want the law on the book just in case they need or want to enforce it. Complaint-based law enforcement, I believe, is not equal treatment to all. It's discrimination because citizens will break, the, they have breaking the law, and only those that get a complaint will suffer the consequences. Those who do not get a complaint will be able to be allowed to break the law without any negative consequences. 
Most citizens do not realize that if the city follows this type of law, citizens can sue their city if they can prove that their life, liberty, or property was hurt or destroyed because the law on the book was not enforced. We have current city law already on the books that requires four off-street parking spaces for a single-family home. The new regulation proposed for an accessory <coughs> apartment requires for two additional parking spaces, a total of six. I believe that this conflicts with our current city law in Chapter 5, Section 6.53, 6.22, and 6.523. All citizens are not allowed to park on the street currently overnight during a snowstorm, and they're only allowed to park up to 48 hours for the rest of the year. Our city does not enforce this unless a complaint is made, and we either need to enforce it, remove it altogether, or change it. We don't need a separate law, which is being proposed with accessory apartments, forcing two more off-street parking. Since we all pay for the roads, I believe we should all be allowed to park on them during the year if we want, even if it's a pain to the neighbors. My poor neighbors probably feel this way. If we have to have an off-street parking lot, or parking law, let's just have one that we enforce. It would make more sense if we said that all citizens must have one off-street parking space for every vehicle that lives at their house. That would be easier than telling citizens to have a certain amount of parking spaces when each family has a different amount of vehicles and a different amount of drivers in the home. The city is allowed to regulate for life safety issues, and that was talked about a lot in a lot of these uh, meetings that we had. Whose life safety are we talking about? The property owner, the renter, or the city employees, that police and fire that have to come in, or all? Is there proof that, or is it just a belief that we're basing it on that someone's going to get hurt? If we really have a life safety issue to the city workers, police and fire, or the property owners, then wouldn't we be applying this to mother-in-law apartments as well? And those who <coughs> rent out their entire home would be regulated the same as we want to regulate accessory apartments, if that's true. So why are we regulating life, sa accessory or life safety on this if we're not going to do it for what we are currently have? Why do we feel that government needs to regulate if you have a <coughs> you need to have a separate kitchen? What if a property owner wants to rent with a shared kitchen and they want to share the kitchen to who they're renting to? What is the problem? With that, if both parties know and agree that that's what they want to do, why does the government care? Um, separate addresses posted on the front of the home was another one. In one area, it said that we will not allow two separate front entrances into the home positioned on the front of the house because it makes it look like a duplex in a single family residential um, and it ruins the character. Doesn't a separate address posted on the front of the home for all to see do the same thing? If two doors look like an apartment, doesn't two separate addresses tell everyone that this home is a, a house with an apartment? Owner occupied. Many of us believe, but it's not proven, that if you own or live in your own home, you take better care of it than if you rent it. But since we allow for single family homeowners to move and rent out their entire home as one unit to another person, what is the difference to the character of the zone and the possible effect to the neighbors if we rent out the entire home as one unit to one large family versus renting out the top and the bottom to two separate small families? Um, it also talks about how many can occupy the home or the accessory apartment. Why are we spelling out how many people can live in a rental part of the home when we are not allowed by state law to, as a renter person because of discrimination per HUD and Department of Labor to tell families how many people are in a family and how many can live in the home. The city code has been put in place that spells this and I've pulled out the code for the Department of Labor because as a, if I'm renting it out, I have to follow the Department of Labor HUD laws or else I get in trouble as a, as a person who is renting something to someone else. So they conflict. I'm actually not a fan of the temporary guests can only stay 30 days. This law should be removed. If someone wants to have a family or friend staying as a guest, the government should not be able to tell you how many days it should be. Um, it's a private property right. One thing that I was worried about um, when I was in Planning Commission on Thursday is um, Ken Young, who I like. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to quote you on this. I'm so sorry, Ken. <laughs> Um, he's very nice to me, so I'm just going to read what he said. It made me a little nervous. 
He said, after two years, no registration or com if no they don't register and um, a complaint has been filed, wouldn't it be it wouldn't be any different than what it is now? Clarification to those people here at this meeting who feel that adding on these regulations to the city makes it more difficult for them to add an accessory apartment. It's not the case because currently the city code does not permit them to be legal period in this single family zone. We have enforced issues where someone has had an illegal accessory apartment and it's been shut down. Now that hasn't happened in a long time, especially not recently because we're in the process of reviewing and we're more <coughs> tolerant where law enforcement is concerned on these. But it's my opinion, <coughs> if we not approve this ordinance, we may get into a discussion of how we should enforce the current situation of illegal apartments more clearly than what we have been. Because we've been in limbo, we might, we might have to discuss further of how we might crack down on apartments that are illegal, which is basically almost all in the city, unless they have been approved <coughs> by the city under the previous code or, or a zone before. Um, we could get a lot more strict and cause a lot more problems in the community by shutting down tons of accessory apartments. We can't just willy-nilly it, and it doesn't matter how we rate, how we legalize these. So it, saying that it doesn't matter how we legalize these, or if they're safe, or if you put six apartments in your basement, or you don't care if there are cars all over the place, or you have a separate entrance. You might call it infringing property rights, but it's important, I believe, to balance. So that freaked me out a little bit, going, if we don't pass, it's almost like if you don't pass this, we're going to start going and enforcing, kind of like MAG did to you guys a month ago, saying, if you don't support HB 362, then you, and you don't support it as a city, then if you want to go up to get the legislation <coughs> to, to do something else, they're going to come back to you and say, we're not going to do anything because you didn't take what we gave you, you flushed it, so why would we listen to you now? It freaked me out a little bit. And then Drew... Armstrong said that there are cities that if the citizens, after they've had time to come into compliance and don't, they've come in to remove the kitchen. That scared a lot of people in the room, especially myself. I don't have, a, my basement's unfinished, so I'm not, I don't have an illegal accessory apartment in my house either. But there were a few things like that that were written, but I hope that helps clarify this. I been to all the meetings and I've never said anything, so I'm sorry it took up a longer time, but I've saved it all. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Before you, before you turn it in, yes. can you just go over the parking one one more time? Yes. Um, current parking law. This is in the code. I found it on the flag lot one is where it's actually written because I, I tried to find where they had the four. You're required to have a four, four parking. It's actually two in, in the code in every zone <coughs> except flag lots is where it's actually written as four. So I'm like, I could not find it in my giant book of codes. Um, do I just to read it again? Will that help? Yeah, express to what you said mm -hmm. about parking. Already on the books, current law, you need four off-street parking places for a single-family home. This new regulation that we're talking about here would require an additional two off-street parking if you have an accessory apartment, so you need six total. This conflicts with the current city law, and I can tell those to you in a minute, where it's, it's about parking, um, public parking. All citizens are not allowed to park on the street overnight during a snowstorm, and they're allowed only to park up to 48 hours on the street for the rest of the year. The city doesn't enforce it. It's on complaint base, and so if someone complains, they will come and enforce it, I believe, but it's not enforced. I believe that we don't need two separate laws, because what's being proposed with accessory apartments just forces two more parking off-street <coughs> parking places when you're not... Since we pay for the roads, we should be allowed to park on them during the year if we want. If we must have an off-street parking law, just have one that we enforce it. I would concede that if we, have, if we do have to make a law, that it would make more sense that all citizens must have one off-street parking space for every vehicle that lives at their house. I don't know how you would word that legally. That's just my slang. If there is proof, or excuse me, it's much easier than telling citizens to have a certain amount of parking spaces when each family has a different amount of cars, different amount of drivers in the house, whether they're renting or not, so having a certain amount number, you actually break the law. Because if the city says you have to have this many and you have this many cars, you've now broken the law. Where are you going to park? On the street, which is illegal, according to Southern. So laws are all over the place, contradicting each other. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for letting me see. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Bischoff, and my address is 1395 North, 390 East. And I have to say, um, I in the past have been completely against accessory housing, and I know that's not the popular um, opinion here tonight. But after listening to the City um, Council and Planning Commission meeting, I watched that online that was held on September 22nd. Um, I understand why the city is um, looking at making these legal, and I have a better understanding of it. But I just want to say that um, I do feel that there should be some regulations behind it. And yes, I believe we all have personal property rights, but I also feel that our personal property rights are always governed by some type of regulation and laws. And currently, our neighborhoods are single family residents. And so if we are going to change that, I, I feel that we should have certain things in place. And I definitely believe they should be owner occupied. Um, I am not necessarily a, having the number of parking spots, um, like was mentioned here, I see the problem that you run into with that, but I do believe that there should be adequate parking and, and some of those things that should be um, addressed and required before an accessory apartment is even allowed. I don't think it's fair for neighbors to have to have um, someone's car in their front yard every day and in a perfect world we wouldn't have to worry about it. but. Sometimes people just are rude, and they park wherever, you know, and I've got a friend who's got a, um, a home in her neighborhood that has every room rented out to someone else, and they've constantly got different cars in their front yard every night, and it, it does get old. And so I realize with the family, you do have the ebb and flow of kids sometimes having, you know, more teenage drivers than at other times, but it doesn't last forever. So I would say to protect the property rights of homeowners that are already living and bought in homes that were single family residents that I would say that you do have to have some kind of regulation and requirements that will be enforced and I realize that's a hard thing because in that meeting I learned we've got one enforcement officer that has many other responsibilities and it is hard. Um, so good luck I guess. <laughs> I'm saying I, I think it should be enforced. I don't know how you're going to do it. So. Um, but it was also brought up that, um, and I, I definitely got more of the opinion in that meeting that this was for health, safety, and welfare um, than I'm getting necessarily tonight. I'm feeling tonight it's more about um, people having the right to earn money. But if you're setting this in place for <coughs> the health, safety, and welfare, I think that you do have to have certain requirements. Um, the fire department said in that meeting that when there's a fire in a home with accessory housing, there does tend to be more loss of life. And so if you're, if you're looking at that as your basis, I think you have to then really ask what's fair to require our fire department personnel to go in. They need to, they need to go into homes that are going to be safe to, you know, be fight, not safe to fight fires, but I mean, it needs to be set up for them that there's not like six different apartments within a house and they, <coughs> Um, I just think that their um, safety of people renting in the home and those that are going into fight fires or respond to things need to be considered. And so um, it was said in that meeting that if um, regulations can't be met, then they shouldn't have the accessory housing. And I have to say I do agree with that because if the purpose is health, safety, and welfare, then that does need to be a priority. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Drew Armstrong, and uh, my address is 995 East Center Street. And um, I'll stand up and kind of speak at you as the chair of the, uh, serving as the chair of the Planning Commission this year. Um, while we've been working on this over the course of the past, what, year, um, at your direction, um, we have had, there are seven of us and two alternates, and I think there have been three before other uh, commissioners that have come and gone or, or left and we've, we've put new people in place and I I do want to tell you that um, this isn't uh, what we've come up with to present to you as far as this goes isn't my um, if I had written it it would have been different I'm sure that if um, Jennifer wrote it it would be different and uh, if um, 
there are several of, of the different commissioners that have very, very different ideas, um, just like our citizenry of different ideas as far as what's important and what's not important. And um, we've spent a lot of evenings um, working on this and working through the idea of, of it. The, uh, the, the parking um, issue here uh, is not our proposal here doesn't represent what I would have um, made as a suggestion where Drew King. Um, that being said, um, it, it, we have uh, you know a couple of the commissioners, uh, some of our lady commissioners, um, that are not realtors, and we've got one that's on one end of the spectrum, and one that's on the other end of the spectrum as far as as parking goes, and we've come up with the best. Um, after a lot of talking and a lot of input, we've come up with the best, I think, that we could come up with, and we, we, we've really discussed these pretty carefully. I am sure that there are gonna need to be changes over time, um, because things will come up that are unexpected and, and aren't um, working as well as we'd like them to, to be working, just like any other part of our, our code. We're always working with it, and trying to come up with the best solution to, and, and I think this is really key, what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance property rights. We're trying to balance the right of quiet enjoyment of the neighbor that should be his expectation to some degree with the right for somebody to use their property how they deem fit. They pay for it, they own it. Um, that being said, it could be the neighbor on either side that's bugging the other guy. And, and I think we need some sort of, you know, the regulation isn't designed to make it a difficult um, experience and to really infringe upon the rights of, of the individual. It's designed to make it so that it, it works for our entire community. We don't live on three acre lots, right? Um, the, the, Lisa said that, uh, I, I did want to <laughs> correct one thing. Lisa said that I had mentioned that, um, that in some of the other municipalities, they actually will go in and uh, pull kitchens out. They will. I don't think that's a good idea. I, I am not in favor of that in any way, shape, or form. I think, you know, you, you, you figure out some appropriate um, what, uh, result for, for noncompliance because it is a health, safety, and welfare issue, and, and we're trying to protect... Um, not only our firemen that are trying to get in windows or, or go downstairs or haul people out of basements or find people who are having heart attacks, but we're also trying to protect um, the tenants that are living in these places um, so that they, there is a, 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 an expectation that they can, can live in, in a place that's safe, just as we have an expectation that we live in a place that is somewhat safe because we have a building inspector that's looked at a home when it was built, and we meet certain building codes. Um, I, I would suggest, I mean, we have looked a lot at different, uh, at different cities' codes, and I think the number in, just to correct something, I think the number of registered accessory apartments before they reopened it back up in Orem is 1,400. And I think since they wrote, reopened it back up, it's well over 2,000, not 200. So people do um, see the value in, in going ahead and, and registering, and, and it makes a difference to them. Um, did, they, did Orem do anything different what, with the reopening of that? What would make it so that they would get some money more? You know, I, well, it wasn't, it wasn't a ton more. They had 1,400, and then they closed the registration in 2004. Okay. And, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, an experience, I had a lady who hired me to sell her home, and um, she had built her accessory apartment when they were starting to get elderly, and her husband had passed away. She went away on two missions in a row while the city came up with the, the idea that they weren't going to certify any more new accessory apartments, and they shut that down for her while well, she built that thing, added it to her house as per code, and they wouldn't let her use it as an accessory apartment and as the as the economy was tanking back in 2008 it made her house unsellable completely 
So, so, so Orem didn't do anything to make all of these new people want to register theirs? Well, they opened it back up, and I think that people who had not registered um, suddenly realized that, oh my gosh, you know, what if the city shuts this down okay. again? And I think that probably scares a lot of them into doing it. I, I don't like that kind of a situation. I hope they never shut it down again as far as that goes, because I do like the ability. I mean, you know, I'm a... It, it, contrary to some people's belief, I, I do have a pretty strong, I mean, as a realtor, that's what we fight for is personal property rights. I think we have to balance those um, because I think it is a personal property right to be able to, to enjoy your property quietly and, and, and not be disturbed or inconvenienced by having um, something next door that is, is really putting you out. Uh, right now, I mean, one of the things that, that I, I want to mention is right now the solution the only tool that the city has is to shut down the neighbor. And so you could be bothered extensively by your neighbor right now. And if you know that that, that little old grandma lady that has those rowdy kids down in the basement that keep parking on your property or wherever, if you know that you complain, if you complain about that, that the only solution is for the city to come in and take that away, then are you going to say anything? Because you do love your neighbor, and you do care about their their <coughs> well-being. And, you know, maybe she doesn't have the ability to solve the problem that's in, on her own property. I, I, I know that, I mean, this is not everything that I'd want it to be. Um, while I don't think you should use Provo's example as far as removing apartments from uh, homes that aren't approved, I do think it might be, uh, you know, one, one of the biggest ones here that when we've gone and talked to other cities about uh, nuisances and problems that, that arise from accessory apartments is parking. And I think that's a, a obvious that that would be an issue that people are, are dealing with. Um, this was not, uh, I mean, what we've come up with wasn't what I was for. Um, this was an amalgamation of a lot of different, different commissioners' opinions for the parking requirement. Um, we put it before you, and then, you know, obviously you're going to listen to the citizenry, um, but, but we've spent a lot of hours putting together what, what we are presenting to you with, with the staffs, uh, a lot of staff help. Um, if you want to look at a different solution regarding... Um, Kind of more on the end of what Lisa was talking about, as far as fitting um, a specific parking need <coughs> to uh, a requirement for an accessory apartment. Do look at, at Provo's quote code as far as that goes. So, thanks. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Matt Godsey, 1026 East, 1100 North. Um, I would like to start off with a suggestion, and this is from Provo City's code. And it is 14.30.030 regarding accessory apartments and specifically regarding parking. And so I think this is what Drew alluded to. And it specifically says, in no case shall the number of off street parking spaces be less than the number of vehicles being maintained on the premises. And that's the verbiage I think that Lisa was kind of referring to as well. I think that would resolve a lot of the issues. You don't have to define a certain amount of spaces or anything else. It's just fact of the matter. This property can maintain this many cars, therefore you have to abide by that. Okay. Uh, some questions I have. Um, so, so let me go back to that. Sorry. Yes. So if you have 10 drivers in your home, you can park all 10 cars on the street. No, you can't. No, you have to on off street. So you have to provide your room. space per so vehicle. On your, on your property. On yeah. street parking laws as they exist in our current ordinance will stay exactly the same. Right. Right. So if I have six parking spots and on my property, I can have six drivers. If I only have four, then I can have four, four vehicles, four drivers. Yeah. Sorry, vehicles, not drivers, but uh, multiple drivers. <laughs> oh, thank you. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for some questions, I'd like to know what... Uh, the inspections. So it refers to twenty-five dollars to cover inspections. What re and what inspections is that? What are we talking about? Ken, would you like to? Okay, it's really. Um, and I apologize. The, what's up on the screen is not the exact verbiage that's in the code. So um, it, the the verbiage in the code does not mention that it's to cover costs of inspections. Okay. It's a registration fee. 
recognizing that there is some administration and, ex and inspection and, uh, efforts that are ongoing. So our so, inspection is going to be done? No. So, no, there's not a planned inspection <coughs> unless it is determined by staff that there needs to be follow-up. So there is uh, written in the code a provision for uh, providing uh, pictures of life safety issues. <coughs> they will need to provide pictures to us and they will need to sign, and these things are not all specifically stated out in the ordinance because they're policy and they're documents. But what, what we have planned to do is to have a checklist of items that will need to be followed or met according to building code. And they can provide us a picture of how that's being met. And then they will sign that this is their property and this is being met. And so that will not require us to go out and check every single property. But what it does is put the burden on the property owner to, that, that they have said that they have this and they've provided evidence that they have it, that they're meeting code. Then if for some reason it's determined that they haven't, then it's, it's a problem that they will have to rectify. Uh, Follow-up question is which building? <coughs> huh? Which building code with these? International building code that is adopted by the city. Okay, so the current version, like the 2016 yes. current version? Yes. So an existing accessory apartment that may have been built in 1980 will now have to be up to the current code standard. If, if there is any remodeling to be done, then it will have to meet uh, city code. If they're otherwise meeting code, uh, we're, again, we're not, we're not going through and making sure that all the studs are exactly whatever, but you know, we're, we're going to be looking at the safety issues and meeting code with that. I, I'm not trying to pin you down or anything. I'm, I'm just trying to get some explanation on that. Um, subsection L, building code, all construction and remodeling shall comply with building codes and ordinance requirements in effect at the time of construction or remodeling in accordance with Utah Code Section 109A511.5, changes to dwellings, egress windows. <coughs> what they're saying is there's a reference to this state code section which allows some modifications or some grandfathering in of existing dwellings that were constructed pursuant to the code when they were constructed. Okay, and is there, uh, a lot of times there's a percentage of remodel that's associated with the invocation of co code compliance? Do you know if there's it anything? It doesn't address that here. Okay. So that would be something Ken's department would have to... So I guess that's something I'd ask for the council is what, what's the council's intent on that to be considerate of an existing accessory apartment in a building that may have been built a long time ago and the burden that may be implored on that homeowner to try and bring it up to current code standard if that's what's required. It sounds like there is some leniency in there which again would come back to the council on what they want to see for implementing um, the level of requirements on that. I can understand things like the, I can't even think what they called, the fire? Smoke detectors. Smoke detectors, thank you. <laughs> Uh, smoke detectors, things like that, they're really easy, they're cheap to be able to put in, but if there's an, uh, an, an egress issue with the window wells, that's very expensive to go in and cut concrete in a basement wall to try and make sure there's big enough for a fireman on an existing building. That's a huge burden on a homeowner. Um, and then, what, what's, the, what's the purpose of the multiple addresses? I don't understand. I would say it's for safety so the police and fire can easily identify that there's an accessory apartment below. Okay, so it's just added information for the you can show up at the house, they can see it was apartment B or dwelling B, so they know where to go in to get the people. Otherwise, you're waking up the whole house. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I, I understand, and I've had some discussions with some public safety um, individuals on that. Uh, I'll address that in a minute. And then, okay, and I think those are my questions. I have a couple statements. Um, the economic concept of private property, first, the rights owners have to exclusive use of disposal of a physical object. Property is not a table, a chair, or an acre of land. It is the bundle of rights which the owner in, is entitled to employ on those objects. The Founding Fathers upheld the economic view of property. They believed that private property ownership, as defined under common law, pre-existed government. The state and federal governments were the mere contractual agents of the people, not the sovereign lords over them. 
all rights not specifically delegated to the government remain with the people, including the common law provisions of private property. In brief, private property refers to the rights of owners to use their possessions, which are enforceable against non-owners, even the government. The British law provided a clear picture of ownership to the Founding Fathers. The common law has three pillars, private property, tort liability, and the law of contract. Private property and tort liability are inexorably intertwined. No one has the right to change upon the legitimate rights of others. I have some concerns. I, I am in favor of accessory apartments or accessory dwelling units, as they're commonly called in contractual law. Um, some of the concerns I have with parking, we kind of addressed those, so I'm not going to re go over those again. The registration, I am not in favor of registration. I do not see the benefit in it. I do not see the need. Um, I understand from a public safety standpoint how that could be beneficial. However, I disagree. And the reason I disagree is because if my child calls 911 and they give incorrect information on where they are in that house, I want my public servants to be able to go in and search the entire house. Likewise, if there was a gunman that came into my house and one of my daughter's calls up in the upper room, yet my sister-in-law who's in the basement is injured as well, I want them to search the entire house, not just one specific location. So the, the multiple address and the multiple information may help for a few seconds, but I want my public service to be able to search my entire house if there's an incident or a fire or anything else. It's, it's the entire thing. I do not see the purpose or use whatsoever for having multiple addresses because in my opinion, if they're called out, they should search every square foot of that building. Um, there's, sorry here. Um, so basically, I mean, I, there, there's a lot of things I, I understand with this ordinance. The, I, I am not willing to give up my constitutional rights for allowing the city or anyone else to have some additional information. That is not something that I'm willing to do. I believe in the constitutional property rights. And if there is something that my house or my property is doing to be a nuisance or inconvenience to somebody else, <coughs> then that's complaint based. Bring it up to me. As neighbors, we'll talk about it. Is there something I can do? We'll take care of it. If not, then it has to go through the correct judiciary system of the, the legal actions. That's why we have three branches of, the, of, of government, so we can go through those things properly. Uh, I believe in limited government. I believe that we should, as a city, value limited government and only employ, and apply registration and regulation when utmost necessary means are, are employed on that. So um, I urge the council to consider this. Definitely we do need a, an accessory apartment to be legalized because that is an inalienable right for property rights. However, the regulations assigned associated with it, I am not in agreement with. Thank you. I'm Debbie Hong, 992 East 100 North. Um, I am in favor of the apartments, except for I do like the owner occupied, and I do like I do like the <coughs> registration. Um, when we moved into our first apartment when we got married, there were some wacky things in that apartment, and it was probably not a very safe place to live. So I would like for protection of the the people renting that they would be able to have. Um, somebody regulating okay yeah the wiring is safe um there is separate access things like that so i think that that's good um and i do agree with lisa and matt and drew about just having a parking space for each car i think that makes sense and that's an easy way to to regulate it so that's all i have to say thanks, thanks. Michael Butt, 936 North, 1420 West. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on this concept that we're talking about of health, safety, welfare. I want to point out, we live in a world where technology makes it possible that we could all have our homes, the blueprints and everything, completely scanned. 
Anytime we needed to make any changes, we would have to submit those so that the, you know, that was all kept up to date. Any responder that came to our home then could pull up a three-dimensional uh, map of our home. We could be chipped so that they would know right where we were in the home. We could have all of our medical history identified in all of that. But that <coughs> does not describe a world of liberty. In a world of liberty and freedom, there's risk, there's accidents, there's tragedy, there's death. And there's a people who rely on the mercy of God in those times. So, although it would be great and efficient to have all of these regulations, and I think that's why they're listed, and why we're wanting them. And that's why I pointed out when I spoke earlier of, I would like some statistical data that shows this is really a problem. It would be it would be best that we recognize that we're not going to be able to solve all these things. We need to choose. Do we want to keep our freedoms and our rights? Which a right we do not have to ask permission to government for. That's what a right is. We do not have to ask for permission. There's not a splitting off of that right. It's not, I have half of this right, and this is okay for government to take over. A right is just that. There's no permission needing to be asked. So we have to choose. Do we want our freedom, which includes all of this risk, or do we want the regulation for our security? Thank you. Anyone else? Lane Thatcher, 120 North, 1400 East. Um, <clears throat> I'm hearing a few things that, that caused me some concern, and uh, I wasn't planning on speaking on this issue. I feel I need to. Uh, one, I'm a little surprised that there wasn't more mention and discussion uh, about the committee that was organized by the city to discuss this issue. Uh, I know one person mentioned it uh, in their comments, um, but from the people I've spoken to who served on that committee, uh, it seemed to me that that committee made a strong recommendation that there really was no compelling interest or need for this level of re uh, regulation. And so uh, it seems somewhat of an omission by the city to, to not present that information. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is uh, I, I'm not seeing any evidence presented that would really show an increased risk uh, to the city, uh, first responders, etc., uh, simply by having an accessory apartment. Any in increased risk above what could potentially already exist uh, in any given home. So, um, again, I'm, I'm not seeing any compelling reasons for this level of, of regulation. Uh, the thing that I think I'm most concerned about is what has been expressed here as an assumption uh, of a right. And uh, specifically, it was mentioned that there is assumed or someone has created a property right that uh, includes the right to regulate and dictate what others can do with their <coughs> inalienable right to own property. And so I'm, I'm confused where this has, has been created or developed because I don't see it in the law. Uh, the Constitution uh, guarantees each of us the inalienable right to property. And uh, I think that's fairly well established. But to extend that right to, to property, to assume that I can regulate and or dictate what my neighbor or somebody across town can and cannot do is really a false assumption, and I don't believe a right that actually exists. And so that, I think, is a conceptual problem that I think is, is being assumed here as a reason for going about uh, this type of regulation and concerns me greatly. Dwayne, could you, could you help us? Where is, is the city portraying what you just said? No, I'm just saying in some of the comments I've heard uh, made citizens. here, you know, that they've, uh, several people have expressed that that is their right to 
dictate what their neighbor or others can do with their property, and, and I believe that's a false assumption. I don't believe that is a correct right. Uh, nowhere near, uh, obviously people don't want to be overly affected, but I think that can easily be handled through normal means of neighborly communication, etc. I don't think is a call for government intervention. Um, the, and, and I certainly don't think that if there is some assumed right there that it even compares in any way, shape, or form to the inalienable, inalienable right each of us have to actually own property. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? <coughs> Ron Tews, 1655 Leslie Circle. Um, just a question, possibly clarification. Um, it looks great, this idea we have presented here. Um, I'm in favor of the accessory apartments, by the way. But um, just this, uh, this period about the ordinance when it goes into effect <coughs> and about the requirement for registration and the failure to register after that period. Um, let's say, right now, I do have a, a mother-in-law apartment, and we have aging parents, and possibility of them coming to stay with us. We had one that we had planned on staying with us that passed away before they could stay with us. <coughs> um, but we now have a vacant accessory apartment. I mean, a vacant mother-in-law apartment, and kids that want to move into it, and, or no, we don't want it, so it's, it's vacant. So, so we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's a vacant, it's a vacant space. We're occupying it with us. So, um, but let's say, it would say based on this that um, we kept it as a mother-in-law apartment. Our kids decided to come in and stay with us, and this ordinance went into effect, and it was a mother-in-law apartment. <coughs> would we be required to register that? With this ordinance, I don't well, think so. then let's yeah. say down the road our kids all decide to move on, and it's past the two-year registration. You what come in and register. We come well, okay, but it's the way this is written. We only have two years after the ordinance goes into effect so to register. Let me, let me just make sure I understand no. what you're saying. You currently do not have an accessory apartment. Correct. It's a mother-in-law apartment. Therefore, <coughs> this two-year period doesn't apply to you or anybody else that has a mother-in-law apartment. Okay. But the day that you choose to turn it into a rental for someone else, you register. Okay. Does that make sense? I just wanted to make sure. That, that's why I was asked. That's, okay. I was asking that for clarification Thanks. to make sure that we weren't gonna, you know, come in and try to register and say, "Hey, how long have you had this?" It's like, well. Since we built the home, and they're going to say, "Well, you got to pay an extra thousand bucks, buddy." <laughs> well, make sure. Thank you. All right. Kira Harris, 60 Alpine Drive. Um, first, I really, 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 really like Provo's parking lot. <laughs> that's basically word for word what I would prefer. That's mostly the main part that's really been bothering me. Um, something else I've kind of been thinking about is it would probably be good to take a look at some of the existing state laws regarding rentals. <coughs> some of that might already be covered here and you wouldn't need to be repeating it. Um, I might be making this up, but I'm pretty sure that smoke detectors are one of those things that like landlords have to provide already. Um, so I think that, you know, where people are saying, hey, we don't need this much regulation, that might be true. It might already be covered in already existing state law. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Can, can you address that, Ken? I'm sorry, what was the question? Smoke, smoke alarms? alarms? Smoke alarms or state laws that already govern uh, rent, renting and codes? <coughs> well, no, I can't address whether, what state uh, codes there are. <coughs> But, but we, we are asking uh, with the registration of the apartment that certain safety features such as smoke alarms be provided and that they shall provide a picture and indication that they have done that. So uh, definitely if there are city or state codes that uh, <coughs> regulate that, then, then those definitely will need to be met. 
Did you have a I, I, I just thought smoke alarms were part of the building code. There they are. Yeah. And then Tina? From a, from a state city perspective, what's the rules on state law and city law? Well, um, it goes from the general to the specific. So there are some areas where the state has preempted the field, which I don't believe landlord tenant law in this particular case is one of those areas. So the city is allowed to regulate, to adopt local ordinances and regulating that. I agree, if there's something in the state law that is already mandated, then maybe that's something we take out of our ordinance and not to be redundant. But on the other hand, it's really handy for people <coughs> to want to know what the accessory apartment ordinance says and requires to have it in one place. One of the complaints that we get quite frequently is that people will have to go into more than one area of the code, our own code, let alone look in the state and then come look in ours too to find out what's required. So, so there's a balancing there. So you reference state code when it exists? You can. Yeah. Okay. And, and the, the specific code we talked about was International Building Code, right? We adopt that. We, they adopt that by the state right. every year. Thank you. Anyone else? Speaking as the I'm engineer? Speaking or? I was going to speak as a rep. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to speak like the President of the United States. But. Name and address, please. Dean Hale, 1480 South, 1300 East. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk tonight about how what's driving the regulations behind these, which I think there should be none, is, the, is, is safety and, and welfare of the occupants, and yet I'm looking here at the text of the, of, of the ordinance itself, where it <coughs> outlines purpose and intent, and it doesn't man it mentions none of those. I'll just read it real quick. It says, purpose and intent, the purpose and intent of the accessory apartment ordinance is to recognize the residential character of Pleasant Grove City and to provide for supplemental living accommodations in the community, as well as provide for supplementary income opportunities <coughs> for property owners. These provisions are intended to provide for affordable housing with reasonable limitations to minimize the impact on neighboring properties and neighborhoods. When I read, read things like minimize the impact of neighboring properties and neighborhoods or um, a recognized residential character, what I, I, I hear that as a euphemism for uh, restricting personal property rights. Um, it's nice that they are willing to allow us to raise a little extra money, um, but is that really the intent and why did the government care what we do with our property? That's a concern. My other, the other thought I have regarding any of these regulations, the fact that the city is, hasn't enforced this for years, and I know <coughs> probably a couple of dozen people who have these apartments, and I would say the majority of them are in a situation where if they had to comply with building regulations or or uh, um, or had to put do away with it for whatever reason uh, to meet these needs here, there would be a um, a tremendous financial burden on them. And um, and sure, there's those that we can imagine who would have no problem meeting this financial requirement. But uh, for the least of these, and for, for charitable reasons, I say we we shouldn't. Um, burden anybody with these kinds of regulations just because thank you very much thank you um, Tina I know we've discussed health safety and welfare is there a way to include that to make sure that that's part of what we're the sure you want to add something added to the purpose statement yeah. and Ken with respect to the, the questions that have come up there's a theme about um, apartments that have existed when they were legal, apartments that have come up when, when the city didn't have a, an ordinance allowing them, and then going forward. Can you explain how the code and the building requirements work where you have prior approved apartments, um, those that were built during a time when it wasn't uh, in the code, and what happens with new ones? with respect to what code are they trying to meet? 
what, what, the, what the burden's going to be. Okay, so if there's any new construction, any remodeling of construction of, of a building that or <coughs> has been identified as not meeting certain safety factors as we've identified in the code here, including the, uh, the fire. Smoke detector. Smoke detector, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, those things are, are going to be handled immediately uh, upon registration. Now, if a, a, a uh, accessory apartment has been constructed previously under a previous code and permitted by the city, then we're not going to go in and retroactively require new things of them. But um, I think it has been pointed out um, well that there, perhaps in, a, in the verbiage it's not completely clear as to what happens with the, the requirement for registering existing apartments. And I would actually... Existing make, apartments that were built... Not when it was permitted. Not permitted. Yeah. Not permitted, but previously cons or yeah. existing now. It could be mother-in-law apartments. Right. And the <coughs> requirement is, I mean, I just want to make sure that we're clear on what that requirement is so that it's, we don't imagine a very obscure amount of money or burden on the individual being more precise as to what this well, is. And, and <laughs> here's the difficulty. It's, it, it's very difficult for us to spell out all the pertinent building code requirements that may apply in any given situation. That's why we need to say it, it needs to meet current building code. If it has not been permitted by the city and they want to be recognized as permitted and legal, then it needs to meet building code. That can be very expensive for some people. Mm -hmm. It may be impossible for some people. It may be just a, a small amount for, for others, but we can't specify and dictate all the potentialities that may occur. But you did say current building code. Yeah. So anything that, that popped up during the time when it was not permitted and anything going forward will have to meet the, the current building code. But the method of identifying that is not a site <coughs> inspection. Right. It's you're asking for photos of certain items. <coughs> right. Okay. So, we're, so we're saying 1985 to now. Right. Not for me. Um, let me just add, and I know this isn't a popular statement, but it's, it's a reality. There are situations where it simply won't be permitted. And there may be existing situations that simply cannot meet a basic level of requirement. This code was not put together to create a situation where anybody, anywhere, can have an accessory apartment without regulation, without concern for any health, safety, welfare issues. We're, we're not trying to make it so everybody can have one. We're making it possible so that those properties that can meet a certain basic level of health, safety, welfare issues can be permitted. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Ken, could you pass that basket over here? <laughs> <laughs> no, if you get hungry, this will end. Are you going to be speaking as city engineer? <laughs> Suddenly we have to regulate it. I feel like it's kind of hypocritical of us, and we either need to regulate both or regulate neither, not one or the other. I'm sorry, I want to go home. <laughs> and I came here to just have the road. That's nice. No, I had a thought. Name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought everybody knew my name and address. <laughs> Maybe East 150 North, the worst road in town. <laughs> I had a thought. And last time I came, I had a thought, and I didn't get up, and I wish I had. So I thought, if... It is a safety measure, and the people call 911. Shouldn't the people that answer the call ask if it's an accessory apartment, or ask if it's another apartment, <coughs> ask if it's another room? That should answer some of the safety problems. Should be the Great. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. 
M&M's. Oh. <laughs> Wait, you have M&M's? <laughs> okay, if there's no one else, we're going to close the public hearing. You guys okay with that? Yep. Here. Right. Okay. Sorry, Ken? I just wanted to add a few comments. You're uh, speaking of director as a citizen. <laughs> I'm not a citizen of Pleasant Grove, okay. so I can't do that. <clears throat> so as director of community development. Um, let me just uh, say a few things. I think that uh, perhaps, um, well, I'll just start by saying that by and large, I believe that the, the differences that have been addressed here that are either for or against the proposal, the ordinance that was proposed, are by, by and large ideological. And that planning staff, planning commission, and all the efforts of those people who have assisted community development through the years to come up with what we've come up with have um, brought forward our best proposal. If we are to amend it further, I think it goes beyond community development and planning. It becomes then more ideological, perhaps even political, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly we would <coughs> want to be a part of and participate, but I'm not sure that it would be um, the best effort to send it back to community development to further revise or further study or further whatever. I think it really comes down to ideological uh, situations. That's my opinion. So recognizing that everyone who sits there is looking at it from a, this is my job and this is what I'm advising because right. this is how we have to do it in order to execute the, the ordinances and exactly. whatnot. And everyone sitting up here, particularly those voting, is doing it politically. Right. I mean, they're politically elected to represent the people. Sure. Okay. And so, and, and that's, I fully agree and understand. Uh, I'm just saying that um, should we desire to make further, greater uh, changes, perhaps it's not the best arena to work with it in a planning forum. Understood. Okay. okay. Um, so I just wanted to say there's there's a few things based on tonight's discussion that I agree that perhaps we can add to, uh, make it a little bit better um, to the purpose statement. I wrote down a few words that we could add at the very end that says, and to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the property owners and residents of accessory apartments. To letter P, where it talks about accessory apartment registration, we could add at the very beginning any person owning an existing accessory apartment that has not previously been permitted <coughs> by the city or the other situations that we talk about there. Um, so I think that, that perhaps is verbiage that is missing. I would uh, <coughs> go along with those types of changes. Um, in, in regards to parking, we do have city code currently in 10.18.3 that talks about parking. There is a requirement that dwellings have two parking stalls. That's just dwellings across the board. So I think that goes in line with our existing code and our, and our, ideology, our ideology for having uh, two additional parking stalls beyond what a single family home would require. That's how we came up with the six. So there is consistency with current code. Um, In regards to whether or not we should go with um, the Provo Code uh, of regulating parking so that there's not more vehicles than what uh, could be reasonably or to, could be parked off street. Um, the, yeah, I suppose we could go that way. I still have a problem with that uh, because you're talking about what the current existing situation is of the property and if the property sells, then those needs changes and, and so we come into difficulties. I think we're just trying to set a base standard for what normally should work. And that's, that's why we went that way rather than the way Provo does it. Is Provo's better? I don't know. Is it? Again, <coughs> ideology. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Jill? Jill, behind, uh, 936 North, 1420 West. Um, as Ken just said, if it is a conflict of interest, some thoughts, why not have the citizens who have spoken up tonight write it up? 
When you say conflict of interest, what do you mean? Conflict. Ken just addressed that it's a conflict of interest for the planning committee to readdress this. Conflict of ideology. I, yeah, I mean, ideology. What he's saying is the planning um, department uh -huh. is responsible to come up with the recommendations, and they're looking at it from the perspective of the planning department. Right. What's their role? And if we modify the code further, other than what it's written with the recommendations, then it starts leaving the realm of good planning. And it becomes pretty much a political decision for another department. So he's saying <coughs> that he can't really take his department and delve down those paths. That's not his, so not his not? area of expertise. So, I'm, so I used the wrong term. So why not take those who have stood and commented, had so many suggestions, thoughts, ideas, impressions. This is who's representing the community. Why not have those citizens work together and write up the new resolution? Thank you. <coughs> Can I answer that? <laughs> Stephen Moon again. There's been numerous committees of citizens that put this together, and they followed it really well. So your suggestion <coughs> has been done already. We, we really looked at all sides of it and tried to protect all rights when we put together what they're using and presenting tonight. Well, what if many of us, I mean, so, <laughs> By the comments here tonight, that doesn't sound like that's how it's gone. It sounds like there's been many who object to the what you got proposed. So it doesn't sound like it's really representing what the citizens are wanting. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> Jason Hunter, 680 East, 300 North. Uh, I think we always have to remember that there can be a silent majority there can be a silent minority. Um, so there have been lots of comments about, I don't like this part about the, the law, I don't like this part. I think I would probably prefer you have enough parking off street to accommodate all the vehicles. So that when grandma's renting her home um, and she only has herself and she's got this big two car garage, she can, you know, and a driveway or whatever, that she can still have a tenant without having to go through the expense of adding an additional two spaces. Um, but <coughs> if the council decides, I mean, that's just my, my little thing with this. Um, and, and we all have little issues. It's your job as a council to um, appease the majority and uh, I think that the majority, those that are for or against this specific thing, even the commissioner that voted against it is for accessory apartments. So find a way to make them legal. If that means regulating to make sure that the neighbor doesn't have 15 cars parked in his way or whatever, let's get it done. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Ken, did you have another comment? Well, that was uh, kind of addressed there. It's just. Um, I've noticed this a lot when when we get a certain group of people in a room, there can be a majority opinion in the room that does not necessarily reflect the majority opinion in the community. And I think that we need to consider all of the effort, all of the uh, committees, all of the input that has come to us over the years. That represents a lot more than what, just what we've heard here tonight. Thank you, Tom. Would anyone else like to speak? Because if we close the public hearing just to keep it orderly, we're not going to take any more public comment. There's just too many of us here to, to do that on everything that's discussed. So now's an opportunity if you have something that you'd like to uh, address. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. 
um, we're going to discuss as a council. Let me, let me just, I took some notes. <coughs> they're not extensive, they're just bullet points of comments that were being made. Um, would it be fair to say that the majority of you here that have taken the time to come tonight and respond to this are in favor of accessory apartments without, a re without regulation? Is that, how many of you said that? How many of you did not say that? Okay. How many of you said you're in favor of accessory apartments with regulation? Okay. Was there somebody here that had a completely different opinion other than those two? Okay. Um, and, it, and it seems to kind of come down to this concept of <coughs> you want accessory apartments and you don't want them to be regulated is kind of the, the issue here. And then some people would like to have accessory apartments with regulation and they have reasons for that. And the ones that, that don't want regulation, it revolves around freedom, property rights, constitutional principles, um, being able to do what you want with what you own. Is that reasonable? And okay. also, it's also the burden of money coming Thank you. The code. Okay. And lack of information or right. other but to the majority, the majority who said we want them without regulation, I think most of you said it has to do with being able to do what you want <coughs> with your property. That's kind of what I heard. We're not going to take any public comment. And over here, I thought I heard some regulation, but it definitely had to do with this idea of if you're going to put something in place in order to make it safe for health, safety, and welfare, you need some form of regulation, minimal as it may be, to make sure that it's complied with so that the health, safety, and welfare is taken care of. Is that what we're hearing? Or do you have something completely different? So basically, you're all in favor of accessory apartments. It's the degree to which you would like regulation or no regulation. Even those that have said no regulation are not with regulation. Did you not? You each put something in there in your statement, or many of you did, like, Yes, except for parking. Or yes, except for, you know, there's something in what you're saying that requires some kind of regulation. Not at all. So some of you, not at all. No regulation at all. And some of you, yes, regulation. Just no comments, just show of hands. <laughs> Nodding heads, thank you. All right. So, so, Council, I think what we're dealing with here is not just a matter of language change. To the code, this is this is a fundamental question of do we allow accessory apartments or not allow accessory apartments? And if we allow accessory apartments, this particular group of people is going to <coughs> allow them, but the rest of the things that you've done to take time to articulate to that other citizens have sat through hours of meetings trying to come up with what would be reasonable and fair to adjacent property owners, to the safety of those that live in the house, that those that are renting, all of these other things that have been considered, we don't want any of that. Just let us have accessory apartments. And by the way, some are saying, you don't really have the right to tell us whether you can have accessory apartments or not. <coughs> that's, that's kind of the gist of what we're hearing tonight. Mm -hmm. All right? So with that, let's let's open it up for comments from the council. I just want to make one quick comment <coughs> without getting a, a lot into detail on how I feel about it. But I find like um, this has been discussed for years and years and years and years. And I find that regardless if you're for or against, there are the same arguments. So people that stood up to say we want to have uh, accessory apartments give you the same argument as the person that stands up and says that they don't want them or they exist, don't 
try to regulate it. And I find that interesting with this subject because it's the parking, it's this, it's all the same arguments, but each side gives the same argument. Just a comment. Thank you. I'll go. Um, I've lived in an accessory apartment. We've owned one that we no longer do. So I, I thought I can speak to... So you've been <coughs> since, since two months we ago? Or? <laughs> Not like 10 years. Um, so some of the notes I've taken. And first I want to recognize the Citizens Committee, Ken's work, the Planning Committee. This is 15 years of work. This hasn't come about in the last month or so. This is a lot of time and effort put into crafting an ordinance that the majority of citizens will will support. Um, to me, I don't understand the difference between a family of eight and a family of four and a family of four in the top and bottom unit. Like I just I don't under, you know, I don't really see the difference. And we're talking about cars and parking spaces and people like it's still bodies in the house. And so I feel like it's kind of cracking down people have an accessory apartment when really it's the same number of people. Same with the blood um, bloodline. I mean, it's free. It, they get a, a full pass and no one else does just because they're related by blood. It's still a body in the house. That was that was one thing. Um, I, I am in agreement with owner-occupied, otherwise it becomes a duplex situation. I'm in favor of only one accessory apartment. I had a resident, um, and it wasn't just based on this, but it's not a townhome, multiple three or more you know, rooms in the, um, or situ situations in the home being rented out. I do like the provo parking based on um, what I've heard tonight and <coughs> the idea that it's the number of people in the home. Um, I do like the, you know, definitely off the street parking, I think that's a safety issue. Um, I feel like the home has already been inspected and if we ask people to make these, these changes, that's, that could be tens of thousands of dollars for people, and I can guarantee you they're not going to come forward. They will not, if it has to be fully inspected, they have to remodel. Um, as Jennifer said, the liability is on the homeowner. It's not city property, and it's if something happens, liability is on the homeowner. Um, let's see, what else do I have? The, the $1,000 fine, I feel like drug dealers would get out easier than accessory apartment owners. Um, I just, I think it's too much. Um, I'm not sure why an outside entrance would be. Some of, some of the things that I've heard people, as I try to communicate with people um, online about their thoughts on this, I'm not sure why we have to require an outside entrance or the separate living spaces. That again, it might just be the right of the homeowner to decide who's living in their home. The 30 day guest pass is, I don't know where that came from, That's, I don't agree with that. Um, so I, I don't know, there's, there's things in here that I definitely like, like I said, owner occupied. Um, uh, maybe a change in the parking spaces to allow for who's ever living at the home. I just don't see a lot of difference, like I said, between a family of eight to ten and two families living upstairs and downstairs. I just, and they have cars and they have the house is still the same number of people. We're just saying what they can and can't do with their <coughs> property. So, um, I mean, I know when we were trying to refinance our home, I had to go through a huge process with, um, this was several years ago, because at the time we had the accessory apartment, I had to jump through hoops. I've had residents call me saying, um, you know, we want to list our home. Can we say that as an accessory apartment? And I had to tell them no, because they weren't legal at the time. Um, I don't feel like I should have to tell a property owner that. It could increase the value of their home, but they can't list it like that because they're not legal. So, I don't know, I, I, so when they said that, I said, well, I have a hard time. Yeah, they do because we've, we've made that, made that rule. Um, the fee to, we can't, we don't have the budget to enforce it. We can't hire a full-time enforcer. And I don't know what the full-time enforcer would do because how do you, you would drive around, but what, what are you looking for? If there's, if there's multiple cars parked, that could be an issue in the city, not just. How do you know it's an accessory? I don't know. I, I think because it has A and B on it. Yeah, that's what it has A and B. Um, I don't know. It's just so those. Are, I mean, those are some of my thoughts, random, okay. and what I've heard not just tonight, but over the past four years, I've heard on the council when this issue has been brought up. 
especially with the last year worth of work that's been done by the Planning Commission and the committee, and, and what I've heard tonight, um, when I've asked the question on social media, the responses I've gotten back. So that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll go. Um, I do like the owner occupied. Um, even from the beginning, even when I was on the planning commission, this was, an, this was an issue. Even when I moved into Pleasant Grove many, many years ago, this was always an issue. And when we started this process, and then the planning commission started, it was keep it simple for the citizens. You know, we don't want to have too much overreach from us. Um, my daughter lives in a accessory apartment up in Logan. When I go up there and visit, I get scared to death. All right, just a simple fact, just maybe because that's a dad factor, all right, maybe that's it. Yeah. And I look at the wiring and all that, and I really hope that the owner <coughs> take a little more pride in his home and, and do it. Because I know Logan has accessory apartment laws. I don't know, are they enforcing it? It doesn't look like it to me. Maybe because they don't have a budget, I don't know. So the safety is a, is a huge concern for me. And, and parking, maybe we do copy probably. I do like that one. The 1985 issue and on, I, I have an issue with because of the cost. It's, it would be huge. Um, it's a large dollar amount. Um, it is a balance of rights for us. Um, listening to our citizens, one of the main things when I went door to door in this campaign was assess requirements and listening to it. And they kept saying, keep it simple. You know, uh, less regulation. Well, Less re reg regulation. I have an instance on my street with that. I would I would love to have neighbors go and speak to each other, right? But I have somebody <coughs> comes and speaks to me and asks me to go speak on her behalf to another neighbor because she may feel intimidated. That's that's her right, right? She can come to me and I I don't have a problem going and speaking to my other neighbor on that because sometimes our neighbors do overreach, right? That's just. That's just us. That's just citizens. That's the way we are. Things happen. Um, when I go speak, things clear up for a week or two, and then they're back. Um, Mrs. Jolly, uh, state of mind. I don't know. Answer your question. It may seem simple, but sometimes I think the dispatch people, when they get a call, people are in a, are in a panic, and and they're more concerned about what's what's going on and, and the care of a loved one or or a neighbor or a friend. And so sometimes that can be a, kind of a state of mind. So when they call when the dispatcher says, stop telling me about what's going on and tell me if it's here or here. Um, would it be simple if they already had that information to them? I'd say yes. You know, the uh, dispatchers can say, hey, this is accessory permanent, part B, downstairs, put them to go in. Um, it could be easy for them. But again, we get into over regulation. And so that's kind of really quick where I'm coming from and some of the, yes, it looks like everyone here is for accessory requirements. I made a simple walk around my neighborhood, one little block, five or six of them, just like that. And I live in a neighborhood where all the homes are built in the 40s and 50s, right? And so some of the, the building codes there, I don't know if they were allowed back in the 40s or 50s, I don't know if that was the time frame, I don't, I don't know. I do appreciate the citizen committees that have taken place and that have looked at this issue over many, many years, the Planning Commission, and for their dedication and their service to this community and, and the work that they do. Because this is not easy, what they brought up, right? Because if we tried to go off what we heard tonight, I, we'd have like three or four pages listed here. So it's a, it was a hard thing. So thank you for your service. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Diana. Ladies first. I'll take the last word. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, so, of course, I have ten people that live in my home. I'm in the <laughs> ebb. I'm waiting for the flow. <laughs> um, my mom and dad just moved in. Um, my 86-year-old mom and dad. So, I have uh, I have too many cars. I have too many people in my house. Uh, and so I, I'm looking at this, uh, um, first of all, um, I am completely in favor of accessory appointments, if that's a shock to anyone. Um, so I have a couple of things. 
there are, and to also address this, uh, I have listened very intently, and I have had conversations with people who are not in favor of accessory apartments. So just because the majority of people in this room are for them, there are a lot of people who um, are not in favor of them, and this is why. There are zones in our city, and there is a perceived value, and I say perceived, perceived value for each of those zones. So for example, if you live in an R19, your lot size is 9,000 square feet. If you're in an R112, your lot size is 12,000 square feet. People buy a, pro a piece of property because of the perceived value. If you are living in R112 and we now put an apartment in your house and you have two families that live there, it now is an R16. So when I stand on my corner I, I, and I stand on my neighbor's front porch, um, I look at my house and I knock on his door and I apologize. <coughs> um, because he bought in an R1, I don't know, what am I, R110 probably. And because of all the people in my house, I am an R1. One. One. <laughs> an R11. One, one. Um, so is there a way that we, so I believe that we're going to accept, we're going to permit accessory apartments. I'm feeling that. So is there a way for us to protect that perceived value of a neighbor maintain the property right of each of those individuals and um, so I believe that there has to be a little bit of, of regulation to protect that value. I think, <coughs> I think it's minuscule. I think that there are a few things we can do. First of all, if it's owner occupied, there is one utility Bill, there's one owner that's listed, and so you are not dividing a zone. Um, that's my reasoning behind owner occupied. Plus, I do believe that if the owner is there, um, the value, um, the safety, and welfare is a little bit more owned. Um, I don't care how many people live there. That is the right. If you're going to start limiting occupants, then, um, then you're going to go to jail. I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to pay a thousand dollars. I agree. I think the thousand dollars is uh, not fair. <coughs> um, I agree with the parking uh, one stall per vehicle. Um, And I think, <coughs> I think if there would be, I, I like, I like the sentence about, um, well, there, there are, there are several parts of this that are very good. Mm -hmm. um, on entrances, I'm, I'm not, I don't want my house to appear as a multifamily home. So I, I would actually like, so my people run through the house. Um, anyway. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. You bet. Ben? Last First, word? I was going to make a point that Diana made very well. I think it's a, an important point to know that we have received communications. I've had a number of conversations with people that are not in this room that do advance the view that we should have no accessory apartments. That is not an unknown view in this city. 30 plus percent of our city population may have that perspective. And we've certainly heard eloquent arguments that permitting accessory apartments fundamentally changes the character of zones that are zoned as R1 residential because people want to have a single family in their <coughs> neighborhood. And there are certain expectations people have when they buy their homes. 
So I think it's a valuable and important point. I loved a lot of what Sid said tonight in terms of recognizing the tremendous work and time that's been put into this particular resolution uh, and this ordinance as it's suggested. But broadly speaking, and Ken's right, a lot of the discussion may revolve around ideology, <coughs> but amongst a free society, amongst liberty-loving people, issues of aesthetics and issues of value of property should be handled through private consensual contracting. In a free society, we do covenants and conditions and restrictions that run with the land that people can agree to voluntarily, everybody can participate in. If you're worried about what your front interest looks like or the front interests of homes in your neighborhood, you create an HOA. You have solutions that are not government based. And really the, the role that government actually <coughs> has is not over aesthetics or preserving property values, it's over health and safety and welfare. And it has been made amply clear, and a lot of people have made the comment, I think they're excellent comments, there is no basis to distinguish between the regulations we impose because some people are related versus some people who are unrelated. And if we go back a slide, I don't know if we can go back a slide, Dagan or somebody who's got the <laughs> slide control. How far did you want? Hold it there for a second, let me check this out. So, you know, here we talk about entrances can all look like a duplex. That's an aesthetics question in my mind. That's overregulation. Uh, there's a fine that I think is excessive. I agree with the comments that were related to that. I think there are approaches to parking that can be done differently. I think, you know, in, in all the other flood of emails and conversations I've gotten on this point, I'll just make this a total side comment, but I got an angry email today from somebody who didn't like the fact that the city was imposing the way that we do our addressing on complexes in the city and imposing as a government something that the post office and the uh, complex owner didn't want. And so I think that's interesting that we would again suggest that we have the way to do that better than private property owners. I don't know if that's the case. But that's an aside. It's this sixth bullet point here where we say building code must be met, which in my mind subsumes all of the concerns about health and safety. If we've got to meet building code, then we're taking care of the health and safety issues. And so what we're really hoping to regulate, and I think it's over aggressive regulation, is a bunch of aesthetic and other, you know, addressing and other considerations. If we're meeting building code, then we've got the fire extinguishers, we've got the fire detectors, the smoke detectors, we've got the proper ingresses and egresses, we have the needs met to make sure that a family that are all related are safe, and so we've also got the sufficient level of regulation with that one requirement alone, the building code has to be met, to suffice to cover the health and safety, the legitimate health and safety and welfare needs of everybody in that complex. Uh, or everybody in that home, whether they're related or unrelated, we've got the needs taken care of sufficiently by meeting building code, in my view. And so I, I concur with the sentiments that have been expressed about, <coughs> you know, data-driven, factual-based information if we're going to regulate anything beyond that. You know, we had conversations about whether Provo's system works better. We don't know. We should find out. How well does Provo's system work? How many complaints does Provo get? What kind of data can we dig into and drill into if we're going to regulate further than just saying building code must be met? And beyond that, we reauthorize accessory apartments. People want them. Overwhelmingly in our city, people want accessory apartments. They don't want them heavily regulated. And I agree. I think that this particular proposal over-regulates. And I think just by putting in the preamble or the statement of purpose, the magic phrase health, safety, and welfare doesn't change the fact that we're regulating a lot of things that aren't health, safety, and welfare, their aesthetics, or their value, property value perceptions, or other, other considerations. So, I am opposed to the ordinance as written. I am in favor of accessory apartments. I am opposed to over-aggressive regulation. I am interested in compliance with law and a society that respects private property rights. Okay, and so I, you aren't the last. I think we ask for no applause at some point.
So um, I was just making a statement earlier. I wasn't uh, making a final statement, but um, um, I also agree that we should have accessory apartments in the city. What I don't agree with is this ordinance that we're about to put through. Um, I feel like there's um, um, I think we can combat the problems of accessory apartments in the city without an ordinance. I think <coughs> parking is an issue, um, is the biggest issue that there is. And so do, if we have to tighten up the uh, uh, parking issue in the city, <coughs> we need to tighten it up for the whole city, not just people that want to rent out their uh, house or their home. I think that we, a little bit what Diane was saying, that we are questioning the integrity of our zoning. Um, if we're going to allow every home, basically, that wants to, to um, by ordinance, that they can have an accessory apartment, then, we, uh, then we're changing the zoning of our, of our city. We are not, I agree with what even Dagan was saying, that then the integrity of the zoning no longer exists. Because we're <coughs> allowing, by uh, ordinance, for people to have <coughs> accessory apartments. So this has come in front of me multiple times. I haven't changed my view on it. I feel like it's a choice of the people, whether they want to have an accessory apartment, if they can facilitate 10 people like Diana can in her home, whether they're all family and love each other, or if um, I remember growing up in my home, um, and my brothers and sisters often commented that we never knew who was going to be living in our home, because my parents would allow anyone and everyone to be in that home. So I don't think we need to regulate it. I think we need to allow our citizens to do with what they want with their property. And if it becomes a nuisance in the city because of parking and other issues, then I think we need to address it, which we haven't been addressing because we don't have the manpower to address it. So. I'm in favor of accessory apartments if the property owner wants to have an accessory apartment. <clears throat> Just summarizing a little bit, um, I think we've heard from <coughs> council members. It sounds like everyone is in favor of having accessory apartments. Everyone has some concerns with the language of the existing ordinance, the way it's been written. Everyone's appreciative of the work that staff and volunteers and planning commission have done to put together what we have now. Um, there are some comments here and there that actually still talk about um, some form of regulation, and I and I think that you know we need to kind of turn back here to the professionals and say, um, in in this ordinance as we currently have it. I'm sure that some of the reasons you worked together were to come up with um, <coughs> those things that were necessary in order to be responsible for providing health, safety, and welfare. And to just allow accessory apartments and kind of take out everything that's in the ordinance seems, seems like we haven't really listened to those that do this for a living professionally. I know those that are in the audience that work in construction, you probably also deal with the International Building Code, and that code is there for a reason. So I, I wonder when we say as a group that we are not in favor of regulation, are we really saying no regulation or are we saying reasonable, minimal regulation? regulation that makes self just makes sense just for health safety and welfare and is uniformly applied to all citizens not selective citizens or screening some people out 
Um, as far as the costs go, I don't know how to address them. I mean, if you've got a situation that's unsafe, you would hope that you as an individual would be responsible enough to take care of it. Right? And if you don't, you're going to have a problem because somebody's going to get hurt. And it's going to be worse than just the money. It's going to be the conscience. So if you're a landlord, and you choose not to take care of that rental apartment or whatever, man, that's scary. Now you're dealing with somebody's life. We've had advice from our public safety people, um, specific um, as to why some of these things were important. And, and I'd like to just pause for a moment and ask some of our public safety people, and maybe Ken and Dagan, those that have worked on this, to kind of give us a little bit of comment on why certain things are in there that are related to your professional field. Uh, maybe we'll start with Ken to give the rest of you a minute to think. Ken's probably put more time into this than anyone else. Oh, boy. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a bit frustrated here. I think um, I would like, if you would like to have a good response and not just an off-the-cuff, answer to each one of the provisions that have been proposed, I might need to take some more time and, and prepare a report for you. I had hoped that there would have been a little bit of confidence in professional ability and review, but I, I recognize at the same time that a lot of this is ideological. And so therefore, I think we can go down the list one by one and say, well, why did you recommend this? Why does this make sense professionally? Um, in the end, I'm not sure how much difference that's going to make for your final opinion and decision. Perhaps it will, but I think there's been a lot of review already that has been discussed ad nauseum, and it, it comes down to what is the majority opinion and what, what will fly politically. Ken, that's fair, and also what's fair is for you to take some time to think about the response. I think that's reasonable. Um, I, I would throw this out to our staff as we think about this. Our staff has had a lot of time to think about it. Our volunteers have had a lot of time to think about it. And the council has been presented ad nauseum over years with a lot of this information. But I'm not sure how many people in this room that took the time to come tonight have been involved or made aware of all of that discussion. And they may just not understand the application of some of these things. And they may also be looking at the way it's written and question, is that really right? So I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you to go line by line. And I recognize your frustration. It's OK. Let's, let's take some time and, and give you an opportunity later to respond. Okay. And right? in the meantime, I would recommend that anybody who has not uh, looked at our FAQ list, where there are answers to those provided, um, that will give you a lot of those. And, and we have presented those in the past. And I think, you know, again, it's going to kind of, to answer everybody's questions and satisfy everybody's desires, it's just not going to happen. Okay. But I will, I will go and, again, review and prepare a report. And Let me, and let me rephrase this. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, and I feel like that's what I'm doing right now. In fact, I'm doing that to everybody. My intent was really to have the professionals say, there are some professional reasons why some of what's in here is actually needed. And, and that's not a report. It's an interactive process with the people that took the time to come and express their views in detail as to what their concerns are. So let's not do that tonight. Let's do that at another time. Is that all right? Yes. So, and I apologize for not being clear as to what I was looking for. That's fine. My, my bad on that. No, no, that's fine. Okay. Should, should um, we just treat whatever you can actually? Can I suggest maybe 
get the rest of pass and then Let, let's uh because obviously the council has some concerns which you've articulated if you can email those all to staff we'll take a look at what current language is and we'll we'll try to address the questions as to why the current code or the current ordinance is listed how it is and then we can address because um, I, I want to narrow down what what the council's saying because I think there's four or five items okay. I'm sorry that we need to, to address <laughs> and we can address those and then come up with some uh, potential language that the council can consider to take out or remove from the current ordinance so that we can really start getting to a decision on, on where we're at. Normally I would fully agree with that, but there are 40 to 50 people in this room that have invested three and a half to four hours that they don't normally do. And they've, they've brought up they're very close to wanting accessory apartments. There's some ideological issues with what's written in here. And they just want to understand. It's them that wants to understand why some of these things are in here. And I don't think a written report to the council. Oh, no, I was, I was meaning that we, we present it back to the public. That would be great. Yep. Some kind of a response, if you will, yep. in another meeting where we interact with those that have taken the time to come and address what of all of this is actually related to their issues and concerns. Yes. Yeah. That, it, and, then, and then we don't yeah. end up with non-professionals up here. I'm a non-professional in this field. We don't go back again and ask another volunteer committee and another planning commission to do this over and over again. These are the people that took the time to come. <coughs> let's, let's try to directly address their concerns. Yeah, I mean, like Ken says, some of the things we probably have already addressed are in the FAQ. We just need to review those. I think there's some stuff that's come up tonight that have, has not been discussed and reviewed um, uh, closely. I think probably on, on the staff level. So, and that's the that's where we need the feedback from the council is to you give us your particular concerns with the ordinance, and then we'll uh, address uh, again potential language. We want to give you guys options to say. Okay, I like that. Let's get that in there. Or no, that's not what we meant. We don't want that in there. Or here's what's currently in there. We want that in there. Or here's what's currently in there. We want that out. So we can almost go a little bit step by step. We can have the discussion so the public can see kind of the, the thinking behind it and then we can get to some decision making on, on your end. Okay. Let me not put the rest of you on spot. I have a comment. I don't okay. think that would be fair. Yeah. I, I just wanted you to... You both want to comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to. <laughs> there, there's been a lot of comments. Here I am feeling like I'm putting you on the spot all of a sudden. That wasn't my intent. There's, there's been a lot of comments about Constitution and, and uh, some concerns that way. So I wanted to uh, just give the group something to think about, um, which is part of the Constitution. It's the Fourth Amendment. It's, it's search and seizure laws, okay? So when we're talking about, you know, somebody even stood up and said, you know, search the whole house. Well, that's very pro problematic to the government, right? So, and you put yourself in that situation, if, if I'm a homeowner and there's an apartment under my house and there's a problem with the apartment under my house, do I really want to create a situation where the government's gonna search that whole uh, house when the problem isn't in apartment A, it's in apartment B. Um, I've, I've been on situations here in Pleasant Grove where we've, we've served, one in particular, we served a search warrant for drugs and stolen property. Nothing in our record showed that there was an accessory apartment in this, uh, in this residence. Um, so we have, so we do all, all of our intel, get all the information, nothing showing accessory apartment. Um, we go and serve the warrant and find ourselves, we're not in the right place. We're, we're in somebody else's home. There's an accessory apartment there, and they're not the problem. Um, but it's not listed. And, and so I think, when, I think when we're, I don't understand, I guess, the mentality of, you know, who are we really trying to hide from? Um, it, we're, I think we're hurting ourselves when we're talking about response times and what, you know, the minutes matter in emergencies and we're going to waste time trying to figure out how to get to you when it's as easy as just saying there is an accessory <coughs> here. Um, I, I don't understand that mentality. I think people need to remember <coughs> this uh, 
government and big brother mentality, well, remember that we're residents too. You know, and I, 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 I respect my rights just like anybody else. Yes, I'm a police officer, but, you know, I respect my rights just like the rest of you. And, uh, you know, I don't want... I don't want something going down in my house or some other problem because just of a little technicality of, you know what, somebody's living in my basement, and that, but I don't want you to know that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. All right. okay. So let me preface what I say by um, stating that fire codes exist because of years and even generations of mistakes and, you know, terrible, horrible incidents. And so, after those things, we learn we <coughs> fire codes. So why would the fire department advocate for um, regulation of accessory apartments? So, please try and listen to what I say next, and try and understand it in the spirit of what I say. I don't care who you are, I don't care what you do, I don't care how rich you are or how poor you are. Every person deserves the same services. Big house, little house, small business, big business. You all have an expectation of services from the fire department, and you deserve those. It's my job as a fire chief to see to it that I provide in the best way possible those services that you expect. Okay, <coughs> that means that I'm an advocate of every one of yours. Every one of you have an, a safety advocate in me. I don't discriminate, I don't care. You all deserve that same level of safety. Okay, if I don't have um, regulation in accessory apartments, I have no way to advocate for that renter. Who is gonna advocate for them? I believe you will. I think that your desire is that you would put all the safety measures in place and maintain them responsibly in your accessory apartment. But I can't even guarantee that up front if I can't have access to it through some kind of regulation. So am I talking about on-site inspections <coughs> or those kinds of things? No. We're talking about simple things like making sure that you do put a fire extinguisher in there or a smoke detector or a CO ex uh, detector. Um, those are really simple things, but if this is not regulated, how would I know, how could I truly be an advocate for that renter if there was no way for me to know that that happened? It could be as simple as me sending out a self-inspection form where you walk through that with your renter, they mark it, they know, you know, and then you just send it back to us. It could be that simple, but if you're not regulated in any way, then I fail to advocate for that person that's renting from you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Council, you've heard a lot of great input tonight. Um, probably one of the most thorough public and politest <coughs> sessions I think we've, we've had in a long time. I appreciate it. I think we're close. Yeah, we're very close. But there is some tweaking that needs to be done. And we don't tweak from here. We don't tweak it from the pocket we don't, we don't tweak here at the, at the table with these kind of things. So um, I would entertain a motion to continue this until we can provide specifics to Ken and to the staff on that need to be worked on. And, and let me emphasize. It will be very important for each one of the council members to express your concerns or questions about certain items because we can be out all over the place. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I want to address your specific concerns. So I'm going to assume that if I don't hear from you, you have no concerns. Yeah. Send an email right now. <laughs> so, Ken, and I just want to say, I, can't do it right now. <coughs> I understand your frustration and but I hope you have confidence in the council as well as you ask for us to have confidence in you because you know, as you stated before if you, I think you're frustrated from making any changes at this point is just kind of a lost cause but if we didn't make any changes then there would be it would be a moot point to hear from the public tonight because we just would disregard what they said and then we would just go straight ahead to approving and our job is to listen to the public 
and and try and find that balance. And and I know maybe the planning commission is frustrated. I mean, it's just it's a very very difficult issue. We want to make sure that we get it right. And so I hope you have confidence as a, in us as well. I'd rather take the time and take a couple more steps than than not. And so just know that your work has not gone unnoticed, but we need to. You know. I, and, and if I didn't make myself clear, and perhaps I didn't state it correctly the way I intended to, um, if there's any frustration, it's just that it would be kicked back into our court to revise and come back. Um, I think uh, answering questions, providing background <coughs> or support, I, I'm, that's fine. Um, I, just, I just wanted, uh, and, and I have no problem with the council changing whatever the ordinance is. I just don't want it don't thrown want back to, to us. Yeah. That's fair. That's very fair. Understood. Thank you. All right. So, Mayor, I make a motion that we continue uh, ordinance directory dialogue. Just the ordinance title. Ordinance uh, 2015 <coughs> 46. Okay. Um, do you want to date certain? I would say date uncertain at this point, at least. Okay. And date uncertain. And you want the short title read? Yeah. Just the top. Just the top. All right. uh, for a proposed text amendment regarding accessory apartments. Thank okay. you. Thank it you. Just keeps it clear. <coughs> yeah. But can we? What's kind of the goal that we have in mind for for a date, Mayor Scott? Well, then is going to be in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like uh, point five. I know what I want. <laughs> let, let's. I, I think the sooner I get feedback, the more responsive the yeah. uh, respond to you is going to be. Uh, you know, everyone here tonight said they want accessory apartments. That's a whole lot further than we were a year ago. Mm -hmm. That's way far ahead. <coughs> so if we're talking about only including regulations that deal with health, safety, and welfare, mm -hmm. and we have a rationale that can be explained and understood and accepted by the public, I think we're going to be okay. And and so that's what the can notice I hope this the public noticed that when we asked for this, the staff turned back and asked the council, not the public. They're asking the council for their input. That means we have to make sure we understand what your concerns are in order to be able to give that direction to them in written form. Or we're going to be right back here again having another one of these discussions. So we have, to, we have to make sure that we understand what you say. So yeah, if the council's confident that they fully understand what these group of people have said, yeah, shoot that email off tonight. So do we have a public hearing again after tweaking? Yeah, it's going to come back for another public hearing. And so the, the reason to throw out a date right now is just we, we, we not, we're not quite sure how big this is. So once we get the feedback from the council, we'll have a better idea. Trust me, we want to get this resolved as, as badly as everybody else does. So this isn't something that this will stay on the high priority list when we get the feedback. We have a motion to continue from Diana. Second. We have a second from Sid. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor, I'd also like to because it's time and Mrs. Jolly and I apologize for them saying this. I'm wondering if we can continue the road discussion to a later date just because of time. We saw the second session that our agenda item. You want to turn that into a motion? Yeah, I make the motion that we <coughs> move item 11, which is an item for discussion, public comment, a lot of needed on a three year coordinated road maintenance plan by Director. Marty, is that going to create a problem? Okay. Yes, Before I vote, I'd like to know if there's anybody from the public that came tonight to hear the roads plan hey, discussion. Donna. You can stay and we'll talk to you. No, <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a motion to continue from Sid to December 1st. To December 1st. Do we have a second? Yes. Okay, Eric. Is there any discussion? Let's discuss. Because I. I think there are people that would like to hear the road plan tonight. I suggest that we have a discussion tonight and again on December 1st. I, I think it's 10 o'clock at night. We've been, uh, we still have item D and we have an executive session. And I don't think any rational or cohesive decision at 10 o'clock at night and we still have other agenda items is a good idea. I think it will give us more time. We won't be rushed. We'll have a, be able to start fresh, hear from the public. Um, I, 
I guess it's too late to start a major in-depth real discussion on a coordinated maintenance plan. Marty, again, this does, does this December 1st impact you greatly or change anything? What, what else no. is on the agenda? I mean, no, we're, on the don't kind of we're ready to give it now, we're ready to give it whenever you want. So. I mean, especially if you take part at the moment, we're looking at another hour. <laughs> but I'm not going to release it until I have a chance to explain it to you. So that, that's right. I'm not, I don't want to put it out on the full public information and information, you know, just to look at without having an opportunity to explain how we came up for the process. I'm okay. What, what we want to okay. So, Ben, I want to have a discussion tonight at a presentation with public input. I'm not sure I'm committed to public input tonight if it's late and the people are concerned about that but I want to have the presentation at least <coughs> I think people came expecting a presentation by about right I think we should hold off until we can take public comment because this is roads is such a huge issue that there's going to be questions from the presentation there's going to be questions that we have and this is another hour hour and a half discussion on that, that 10 o'clock tonight can I, can I say one thing is that I am not anticipating a lot of discussion necessarily um, Yes, it can be opened up to ask questions, but I mean, the whole goal was to prepare a plan of our recommended way to move forward, not to come and say, what do you think, or why are you doing that necessarily? We can explain those, and if we want to sit here and talk for two hours, I would love to. I love roads. I can explain every road that we've looked at, we visit them and looked at them, and would be happy to do that, but I don't know if that's... That's not what I came prepared to do, is to um, necessarily ask if this is the direction or anything like that. I wanted to present to you my recommendations of how I think we should move forward for the next three years with our road budget that we currently have anticipated to come. Okay, so there's, a way to, there's a way to resolve this so we don't spend too much time on whether we are going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, we have a motion to I continue and a second by Eric. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Three. Any opposed? Opposed. I'm good to discuss or not. So, <laughs> so one abstention. Okay, motion carries to continue. That would be three to one or th three, three to one? Three to one to one. Three to one and a half. Three to one and a half. <laughs> one abstention. It's channel four, I don't care. <laughs> you got me with Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Okay, um, item D is 10D is to consider for adoption of resolution 2005-040 authorizing the mayor to sign a purchase agreement with Kevin Cook for a parcel of property of 0.347 acres in size located at 383 South Locust Ave, Pleasant Grove and providing for an effective date. You have a presentation there for us, David? Uh, picture shows the property. So this is a piece of property along Locust Avenue, right next to the pool. You can see the pool there in the background. So the council's had a long-standing policy of acquiring properties here adjacent to the park and to the rec center as they come available. Mr. Crick contacted Scott a couple months Probably ago three or four months ago. and uh, indicated a willingness to sell the property. They have uh, plans to move out of the state. And so we've looked at it and negotiated a price. We have a fair market appraisal. This shows uh, their boundaries, including the little red cross hatch areas, a little bit more property that they picked up a couple of years ago when the previous owner of the home to the south did a boundary line agreement with them. So right now, the city owns the home to the north between this property and uh, the park. And you can see to the south, the, the blue outline property this is an older area, so you can see one of the homes that used to be there. But <coughs> as I think over probably the last six years, we bought a couple of them right at the end of the year. Which property is not currently owned by the city from there? So the, the, green, the green and the blue are not currently owned. The green is being offered for sale to the city. But everything else north of everything the green, else north of all there, the way to the all entrance. the way to the entrance to the rec center okay. is owned by the city. So I don't have well funding. Uh, the revenue is from park impact fees, uh, dedicated for purchases like this. Purchase so price is one hundred and forty-five. One hundred forty-five thousand. 
Okay. Questions from council? Plans for the two homes there, mm -hmm. in the green and then one to the north. So we're talking with Dion. Recommendation is that we, so right now we rent the home to the north and uh, recommendation would be <coughs> to plan for a demolition of both homes in the spring, give good adequate notice to those residents. The cooks have already moved out of their home. Um, just so that everybody is aware that we took this into consideration, the cooks did have a fire in that house <coughs> months ago. The appraisal of the property did reflect that. The, so the purchase price reflects the, the damage that's on the home. So, so it's not rentable? It's not rentable. It would, it would require work to make it into a livable condition. Again, the city's purchasing it not as a home, not as a rental property. We're purchasing it as an expansion of the, the park area. How many acres is it, those two houses combined? How much does that add to the park? <sighs> Mr. Cook's is 0.34, and I don't know offhand what the size of the other property is. Okay, for purposes of disclosure, can you please talk about the difference between appraised value and that parcel right yeah, there? Yes, so the appraisal came in at $140,000. Mr. Cook asked for $145,000 to reflect some differences in the legal description. So the old part of the city, a lot of our legal descriptions are based on the lot and block, our own city township reference system. A lot of those reference points have been lost, and the county struggles to apply <coughs> that to the modern section corner system. As you look at the county parcel map, Mr. Cook's uh, legal description, <coughs> you actually slide those green lines south about 15 or 20 feet, but going through the middle of the house. When he did the boundary line agreement with the neighbor to the south, since that description is tied to the section corner system and has a really good description, as the county drew it, they, they cut his property back. And so if you looked at his tax records today, I think it shows it's 0.29 acres in size. And that's just, that's their reflection of the deeds that have been recorded. So as I looked at, as, as we looked at this, I pulled his legal description from when he obtained the property, <coughs> drew that in, that is the green line, and that reflects 0.319 acres of ground. The boundary line description, the boundary line agreement that he signed with the neighbors to the south is the blue line in its entirety. And so using the aerial photo as a guide, <coughs> we, I slid the green lines over to, to match the fence lines that are there, and then said, okay, a good estimate of the difference is about 1,250 square feet. The appraisal used a valuation of $50,000 an acre. So using that, we could put a valuation to this extra land. We also talked to the surveyor at JDB Engineers, who does work for the city, and said if you were to come in and do this uh, for Mr. Cook or anybody else's interest, what would it cost? And that was another $2,400. So between those two things, the extra $5,000 is justified. So part of that would be $2,400 in surveyor's fees. There is value in the extra land that's there, and there's a delta of $500, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So in this particular case, since the city owns everything around, it, it's quite easy for us to resolve any questions about property boundaries because we are the other owner on three sites. And since it's already been resolved with the property owner to the south, there's no real need for the city to go through that exercise in determining exactly where those boundaries are. Questions for staff? Okay, whoever makes the motion, I think you need to include the amount, which is on page two. Page two, item two. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, <laughs> but we can just make mention of that one more time. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mayor, I make a motion that we adopt, that we authorize the mayor to sign a purchase agreement with Kevin Cook for a parcel of property of 0 0.347 acres in size, located at 383 <coughs> South Locust Avenue, Pleasant Grove, Utah. Or in the amount of $145,000 and providing for an effective date. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Diana and a second by Eric. Diana? Yes. Cindy? Yes. Eric? Yes. Sid? Yes. Ben? Yes. Motion carries. 
Very, very sad balance. to lose the Cook family, by the way. Was he Wonderful. standing at the door? No. No? Okay. All right. She's the sister of David Sterling, by the way. Her oh. own stuff. Go to um, Mary, can you take a bathroom break? Yeah, I think. Well, are there any plots? No. Okay. Let's let's take a little bio break here, five minutes. Thanks for coming, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay. The next item on the agenda is to review the December first. Um, the items for the December 1st <coughs> council meeting. Uh, I think this. there are some planning items that have not been put on there. I've been out of town for a few okay. days. I'm sorry. Well, we have we, we have two weeks, so we're okay. All right. Um, the ones that are on here, we have two presentations. One from the municipal Utah Municipal Clerks Association. And then another one from the canine. Uh, is that from our own canine? It's a, it's a, it's a um, citizen, a young man who, uh, he's not a resident of our city, but he's, he's went out and got some donations toward canine programs, and he donated, I'm not sure, I think it's going to be four or $500 to our program, and he just wanted to award that. To wow. That's <coughs> great. We'll look forward to that. Can we put people's names on there so that when we... Yeah, thanks. It's kind of embarrassing. All right. Uh, 10A, continued item to consider for adoption resolution 2015-039, uh, authorizing the mayor to sign a land lease agreement with Verizon. I think we've discussed this yes, one. Yes, we're just waiting for Verizon to finalize their uh, attorney comments. I'm waiting for them to send it back to me, and they haven't done it yet, but I would anticipate that okay. already by next week. And then also we'll have, um, under item 11, which has nothing, we'll have the presentation on the three-year road plan. Um, we're also going to have the, we already did that one. What was the other one? Is it, it's not, we're not going to do accessory partners. No, that's not until we get right Okay. Uh, was there anything else we wanted to include? At this Ken, point, will, no. Ken will get back to us. Yeah, that's right. the planning. Okay, right. great. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Neighborhood and staff business. Libby, are you staffed? What, what are you missing? Will they mark? <coughs> So a little bit, little Denmark now, mm -hmm. and then in six weeks you're going to need one for Monkey Town. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been turned out twice, Libby. So sorry. I'll go who, one more time now. Who lives in Monkey Town? Town on the town. council? Anybody? No one, but Drew does. Drew, do you live in Monkey Town? I am a monkey. <laughs> you're a monkey representative. <laughs> could you, could you help us maybe identify some? individuals and talk to them and see if they're willing to yep. to come and talk to me and talk to Libby. Yep. Okay. Maybe give the names to Libby so that <coughs> you can contact them. And, okay, great. All right. Ken? Uh, I don't know if you want to hear any more from me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> David? Thank you. Dion? Uh, just a reminder of the trail open house Thursday night, six o'clock. <coughs> here. Six days. It's here? Six o'clock. Did you say it's here? Yes. Okay. In this room? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Marty? Dave? Actually, Marty? there's one thing. <laughs> Marty? 1300 West, Storm Drain Line. Uh, they should be tying that in uh, yesterday. So hopefully, we've got the Storm Drain installed along 1300 West for the good ones and the flooding issue, so hopefully that's gone. Great. Thank you. Mike? Nothing. Nothing. Sherry? Sherry, you're almost blonde. Sherry, I love your hair. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Thank you. No, that's so cute. Yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we have 
a lot of programs going on this week. So in addition to our regular story time, music programs, and Spanish story times, <coughs> we have, tonight we had a Parenting with Love and Logic class. Tomorrow we have a Home Buying 101 class. We also tomorrow have a Reading to do with a Dog program um, for kids who just want to read to a dog. I got <laughs> um, a live dog? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can have it. <laughs> um, apparently the kids open up when they don't otherwise with this dog. Is that new? Yes. Cool. We also have a book club meeting tomorrow night um, for adults. And then Thursday we have a writer series and we have an after school program and we have a mother daughter book club and we have a book sale Thursday through Saturday. And then Friday we have team night. <coughs> so was that all? <laughs> so yeah, we're busy. We and we actually ran into a scheduling issue because we have too many things going on on Thursday. But it's a happy problem. <coughs> the elevator. They still haven't given me the money. <coughs> Thanks, Sherry. Mm -hmm. Scott. Uh, just a reminder, we have the uh, ribbon cutting for Battle Creek Park in the new field house of the high school uh, next Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Right. Do they send you guys invitations? Okay. Did everybody get one? So, uh, public's invited. I mean, it's, uh, it's open to anybody that wants to come by. The high school is doing, uh, I think, free entrance to the basketball games. And they're going to have free There's food. a girls game and then the boys game. The boys game. game. And so they're they're uh, they're throwing kind of a big celebration. The, the part we're involved in is the kind of the rechristening of Battle Creek Park and the improvements that have been done. So. Rechristening sounds like whiskey bottles. Yeah, something like that. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> along the tennis courts or something. Anything else, Scott? That's it. Okay. Tina. Nothing. Okay. David. I had the opportunity to uh, go and visit Geneva Rocks Point of the Mountain <coughs> aggregate production facilities today, and. Uh, it's interesting, people don't realize what an asset that facility is. <coughs> the material that comes out of the point of the mountain, and there's a lot <coughs> less of the point than there used to be many decades yeah, ago, true. provides a foundation for much of what we build here in the community. Mm -hmm. so. Are they the ones that are like moving in across the freeway are, and dropping in? Uh, that's a competitor working on the, the freeway project, but they're actually up about 300 feet above where you launch at the air park removing material up there that they bring down and distribute all throughout the Pretty soon the whole mountain will be gone. Yeah, pretty soon there will people like, why do we call it the point of the mountain? Yeah, there isn't one. I wanted to get lots of work there. Anything else? Kathy? I just want to thank Public Works and Park for their help with putting out signs at the polling places and flags. And appreciate it. That's great. Anything else? Okay, there. Jim, thank you for all those who <coughs> were in and glad it's over. Mm -hmm. We can move forward and respect each other. Um, mm -hmm. There were some things said earlier tonight that I disagree with or represent me wrong, but that's open session. And I, I, I'm okay with that. So anyway, with that, I'm looking forward to moving forward as a city, and I'm excited. So I'll just keep it simple. Okay. Okay, Anna? Um, Christmas lights coming on, and um, I saw lots of crew guys out there. Yeah, they'll come on a week from tomorrow night, okay. the night before Thanksgiving, with the exception of Main Street and the City Tree. That will be, I believe, the 30th, correct? The Monday following Thanksgiving. That's the 30th. Right following. Yes, the Monday okay. following. Someone remind me so I can call Sid and ask you to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> What, what's the temperature going to be, Hawaiian boys? <laughs> so, I thought the lights come on when we do the tree lighting. Main Street does. Mm, okay. The, rest of the, city the tree will be lighting. So the tree lighting is Monday the thirtieth at what time? Generally about six. Six o'clock. At six o'clock. Then we're going to have Santa comes. <coughs> and then is Santa still coming to the library? Um. 
We have a little bit of time. Sure. We can work that. We don't really. It's in like 42 days. The tradition is he comes in on the fire truck and then goes yes. on to the library. Yes. I'm assuming it will be. I'm sure it'll happen. And the, and yeah. the thing Mrs. will work. Claus Mrs. Coming. Claus is coming. Oh, and then can we, can, we get, sure, can we get that on the city slider, like on the, on the website? Thank you. Eric, anything else? No. Okay. Someone asked me if it's going to say anything on top of the old wreck this year or not. Just like. Um, we're so disappointed. We have a lot of people who are coming in and coming after you, yes. Well, it's been a couple of years since we've yeah. yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a like the issue. city complaint of all time. But it's not It's not that the roof is not, um, it, it's not a structural safety thing. It's a pitch. It's the guy's safety thing. It's yeah. the OSHA rules. It's the OSHA. Okay. Diana. No, I think I've spoken more. <laughs> okay. Ben? I had a couple questions for you, Marty, about uh, road stuff. I know we didn't, we're putting most of that discussion off until December, but uh, up in the Battle Creek neighborhood where that water main was repaired, the road hasn't been patched, it's still a gravel pit. Is there a, a time frame that that's going to be reached? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get that coordinated. So that was last Sunday night, so it should happen in the next week or so. They generally try to get it within a week or two, but they coordinate with that with the, with the street crew to come and patch it. So. I'll just, uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow. <coughs> it occurred to me that last time I drove by it, I was thinking that that was the same exact area where Crestar a few weeks ago was doing work on there. And so I, I wonder, just pure speculation, but whether there was something related to Crestar's work that may have caused that loss. <coughs> when they dug that out, there wasn't any evidence. Uh, maybe it's related, but no evidence that they were crossing at that location or something that they would have excavated at that point. Their trench was not near that. At least that I could see from the pictures that I saw. I wasn't there physically to, to verify that. But. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I was just primarily curious when we would see that. Just just so you're aware, that that line has been on our very long term replacement plan back probably for the last six or seven years. And it's in dire need that we get that replaced and I think you'll recognize that in the upcoming road plan. Thanks. <coughs> That's all I have. Okay. Sid? Nothing? Just okay. Cindy? Nothing. Okay. Um, you'll notice that I've, I've started to send requests to the council to attend different functions around the valley. Mm -hmm. That's because I, I can't be in multiple places. <coughs> I have a family and a life, too. So you're all invited to continue to volunteer to attend right, those. I, I appreciate the the opportunities That's to good. do stuff. I appreciate you guys filling in because okay. No plats. We have talked about most of the calendar. We will be city offices will be closed on the twenty sixth and twenty seventh. Okay. There's a public safety building committee meeting tomorrow night at 7 in here, and we'll be reviewing the, uh, the, proposal the RFPs from yep. the various architects. Yep. Okay. How many did we get, Scott? We got six. So they're in the drop box for the public safety committee members, and uh, we, I think they probably have had a couple days to look at them, and so we'll review them tomorrow and see so, what the, what's so the goal. So the goal will be to try to narrow that down and make a recommendation to the council so the council can <coughs> a council function to, to approve those. All right, we need to have an executive session, so I'll call for a motion to uh, adjourn the regular session and go into executive session to discuss personnel. Mayor, I make the motion that we adjourn from regular session and go into an executive session to discuss, discuss the character fitness and uh, mental health of those individuals.